In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Policies can either make or break a country and its people. Hence, they should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socioeconomic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. For instance, the DPRM has centered on issues pertaining to regulations, risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, the new globalization, and the reforms needed to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This 2021, to follow through on last year's theme on innovating governance for the new normal, the DPRM is focusing on the theme Reset and Rebuild for a better Philippines in the post-pandemic world. Through this theme, we wish to emphasize that to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic and create a better Philippines, we need to reset our paradigms and practices by balancing the interests of people, profit, and planet. This means placing equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being and sustainability. To make this possible, the government should set the right policies that will allow all citizens, regardless of status in life, to access essential public services and will protect all segments of the population, especially the poor and the vulnerable, from various risks through effective social protection systems. The business sector, for its part, should explore ways and areas where it can be both profitable and socially responsible. Business owners and operators should embrace decent work principles, provide the best service to their customers, and care for the well-being of their employees, the community, and the environment. 
Meanwhile, the civil society should continue reaching out to sectors that do not have access to government channels. It should also strengthen its advocacy for more accountable and responsive governance and more sustainable business practices. The academe also has an important role to play. It should ensure that the new modes of delivering education and training under the new normal are accessible to all and will not widen economic and social inequalities. As individual citizens, we also need to start living more responsibly by adopting more sustainable lifestyles. We should start the reset and rebuild agenda with ourselves to effectively influence others. Collectively, we all need to work together. The government, business sector, academe, civil society, and the general public should join forces in pursuing a shared vision of an equitable, sustainable, and resilient post-pandemic Philippines. Know more about the DPRM and how you can participate by visiting its website. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Policies can either make or break a country and its people. Hence, they should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socio-economic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. For instance, the DPRM has centered on issues pertaining to regulations, risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, the new globalization, and the reforms needed to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This 2021, to follow through on last year's theme on innovating governance for the new normal, the DPRM is focusing on the theme Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the Post-Pandemic World. Through this theme, we wish to emphasize that to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic and create a better Philippines, 
we need to reset our paradigms and practices by balancing the interests of people, profit, and planet. This means placing equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being and sustainability. To make this possible, the government should set the right policies that will allow all citizens, regardless of status in life, to access essential public services and will protect all segments of the population, especially the poor and the vulnerable, from various risks through effective social protection systems. The business sector, for its part, should explore ways and areas where it can be both profitable and socially responsible. Business owners and operators should embrace decent work principles, provide the best service to their customers, and care for the well-being of their employees, the community, and the environment. Meanwhile, the civil society should continue reaching out to sectors that do not have access to government channels. It should also strengthen its advocacy for more accountable and responsive governance and more sustainable business practices. The academe also has an important role to play. It should ensure that the new modes of delivering education and training under the new normal are accessible to all and will not widen economic and social inequalities. As individual citizens, we also need to start living more responsibly by adopting more sustainable lifestyles. We should start the reset and rebuild agenda with ourselves to effectively influence others. Collectively, we all need to work together. The government, business sector, academe, civil society, and the general public should join forces in pursuing a shared vision of an equitable, sustainable, and resilient post-pandemic Philippines. Know more about the DPRM and how you can participate by visiting its website. Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon or good evening to those who are in time zones different from the Philippine Standard Time. Welcome to this uh, webinar three of the PIDS Annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC. It is exciting to see the amount of interest that our APPC webinar series has generated, and uh, we are confident that this conference will trigger more discussions 
on the kind of post-pandemic recovery that we need and on what we must do to achieve that. To further set the tone of our APPC Webinar 3, let us welcome the PIDS Vice President, Dr. Marife Ballesteros, for the opening remarks. VP Peng. Aniceto Orbeto Jr., let me welcome you all to this uh, conference. First, let me acknowledge the presence of officials from different sectors, from the government, under Secretary Mercy Sombilia, the National Economic and Development Authority, under Secretary Virginia Orogo, the Department of Agrarian Reform, from the Department of Labor and Employment, Assistant Secretary Roderick Planta and Assistant Secretary Alex Avila. From the Department of Foreign Affairs, Assistant Secretary Gina Hamoralin. From uh, and Assistant Secretary Eric uh, Tamayo. Uh, again, from the Department of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary Maria Duarte. From the Bureau of Internal Revenue, Deputy Commissioner Lani David. From the National Privacy Commission, Deputy Commissioner John Naga. From the Senate of the Philippines, Director General Ronald Golding. From the Department of Labor and Employment, Executive Director um, Amna Satumba and from the Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute Executive Director, uh, Josefina Almeda. We are also pleased to welcome the local chief executives, uh, Mayor Josephine Bangsil of Luna Apayao, Mayor Victoria Ina Pavis of Masingal, Ilocos Sur, Mayor Josefino Miranda of Santiago, Ilocos Sur, and Mayor Rosita Rafael of uh, Natividad, Pangasinan. From the private sector, we have uh, Chief Executive Officer Jerome Palaganas of Nan Nanotronics Incorporated, Vistaland Chief Finance Officer Brian Eda, Social Weather Stations Chairman Emeritus Mahar Mangahas, Philippine Retailers Association President Rosemary Ong, Mr. Bern Romy Bernardo of uh, President and Managing Director of Lazaro Bernardo and three uh, and Associates, Bankers Association of the Philippines Associate Director Arnel Almad Almaden, RCBC Director Mr. Cesar Viranda. From the Academe, Cagayan State University President Urduha Al Alvarado, University of San Carlos President Narciso Celan, College Foundation President Fedelina uh, Tawagon, De La Salle University Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation Raymond Tan, Central Luzon State University Dean Matilda Recto, University of the Philippine School of Business Dean uh, Joel Torres, UP Mindanao School of Management Dean Aurelia Gomez, De La Salle University Dean Marides Chong. And from our CSO, NGOs, and INGOs, ILO Country Director Khalil, Khalid Hasman, UNIDO Country Representative Teddy Monroy, FAO Representative in the Philippines, Kati Tenaymen, Institute of Corporate Directors Trustee Alfredo Pascual, Small Enterprise Research and Development Foundation Trustee Tony Calinos, Chemonics International Philippines Country Director Melissa Agabin, Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy President Amina Bernardo, Laguna Federation of Persons and Disabilities President Antonio Anthony Rebenke, Philippine Business for Environmental Stewardship, Secretary General Felix Vitangol, Center for Energy, Ecology and Development Executive Director Jerry Arances, 
Philippine Science, Social Science Council Executive Director, uh, Lourdes Portus, Philippine Code Program Director, Jeremiel Raton, Masagana Sakahang Incorporated Director, Daniel Agustin, Samahan ng Kabataang Voluntario ng Pilipinas Regional Director, Albert Lee. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academia, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS and SERPI Facebook page. So I welcome all of you to the third session of this four-part webinar series of the Annual Public Policy Conference for APPC, which is the highlight of the Development Policy Research Month celebration. Every year, we select a theme from a wide array of development issues. And for 2021, our theme is Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the past post-pandemic world. Or sa Pilipino, Buling Magsimula at magtayo tungo sa matatag na Pilipinas pagkatapos ng pandemia. The main message that we want to express is that for the country to recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to reset our paradigms and practices by balancing the interest of people, profit, and planet, or placing equal importance on the economic, social, and environmental well-being of society. We are now in our third webinar series. And for those who missed the first two webinars, you, you may watch the recorded proceedings on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Today's webinar will discuss the topic green and inclusive recovery. Promoting green and inclusive recovery is an important component of capital reset. It is a topic that resonates deeply in this pandemic as we witness the consequences and crisis that can result from our neglect of the environment. COVID-19 has amplified the weaknesses of solid waste management in the country. The increased volume of waste from the widespread use of plastics, disposable masks, face shields, personal protective equipment, and hazardous waste from hospitals has overwhelmed our landfills and our waste disposal systems. On carbon dioxide emissions, while there is a large drop in air pollution as a result of the global lockdown, this has no significant impact on the climate change status that we are now experiencing. This is based on the analysis of Manila Observatory and National Resilience Council Technical Working Group led by Dr. Rosa Perez. Just yesterday, I also read from the business news that for a developing country like the Philippines, we cannot do away coal-fired plants. According to Avoid His Power President and Executive and Chief Executive uh, Emmanuel Rubio, Coal is still the most economical and viable options to meet the Philippines' energy needs, and this will be so in the next 25 years. So we really need to find ways to reduce emissions and find long-term solutions to conserve our environment for the years to come. From the data, from the new data from OECD, member countries and key partner econo economies have allocated about uh, 336 billion US dollars to environmentally positive, positive measures within uh, their COVID-19 recovery packages. However, OECD said that this only amounts to 17% of the total sums allocated for COVID-19 economic recovery. The funding does not consider other environmental dimensions. So in other words, the current resources allocated for environmental measures are not sufficient. Similarly, the 
the World Bank has also provided financing to help countries recover from the pandemic. In a statement of World Bank President Mr. David Balpas, he highlighted key features of the World Bank's Climate Change Action Plan for 2021-2025. It includes a new target to direct 35% on average of its financing to climate and a commitment for at least 50% of World Bank climate finance to support adaptation and resilience. Also, the World Bank Group is set to align its financing flaws with the goals of the Paris Agreement by mid-2023 for the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and by mid-2025 for International Finance Corporation and Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. In addition, the Bank Group has also stepped up its support to countries' climate commitments that will pursue transformative investments in the sectors that contribute most to emissions. The Asian Development Bank, on the other hand, has been exposing the expanded use of renewable energy and other economic intervention that support sustainable jobs and development while preserving and protecting natural resources. According to the ADB, taking strong climate actions will generate over 65 million new low carbon jobs by 2030. So these are just some of the developments in terms of how organizations and countries are dealing with environmental impacts of the crisis. This morning, we have invited international and local experts to help us understand the science of green and inclusive recovery and how to operationalize it. We are honored to have with us Dr. German Velasquez, Director of the Green Climate Fund's Division of Mitigation and Adaptation, and Professor Cole Lian Pien, Professor of Conservation Science, Technology and Policy, and Director of the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at the National University of Singapore. To provide the Philippines, the Philippine perspectives into the discussion, we also invited Mr. John Eric Francia, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the AC Energy Holdings and Secretary Emmanuel de Guzman, the Vice Chairperson and Executive Director of the Climate Change Commission. So I would like to thank our resource persons and all of the attendees for joining us in today's webinar. Please stay with us until the end of the webinar and let us look forward to a rich and lively discussion on the topic. Finally, I would like to thank the Banco Central ng Pilipinas for the support given in the conduct of this year's APPC. Before we hear from our speakers, let us watch this video which sums up the message of this year's DPRM and APPC theme. Thank you. Almost two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, nations all over the world are still grappling to address its impacts. In the Philippines, the pandemic has had an overwhelming effect on poverty and inequality, with certain groups more affected than others. Until now, people are forced to stay at home. Businesses which are already struggling to recover still have no choice but to halt their operations from time to time. And students are still finding ways to adjust to the new modes of learning, with physical classes still being prohibited. The crisis has strained health systems, exposing long-standing gaps in public health, and revealed major gaps in the current social protection systems. The pandemic has worsened existing environmental problems that the country faces due to the surge in the volume of wastes. Making matters worse are the new and more transmissible variants of the virus, causing more hospitalizations and deaths. 
Even countries that were initially successful in instituting protocols are once again scrambling to adjust their strategies. Most people ask, is there an end in sight? How can we move forward and recover from this crisis? It is about time that we reset our systems and start anew. Resetting means clearing errors and removing problematic parts, then rebuilding them by making the necessary improvements or by creating new ones so that we could come out of this pandemic better and stronger. Inspired by the World Economic Forum's call for the Great Reset, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, is initiating a much-needed discussion on resetting our paradigms to rebuild our country toward an equitable, sustainable, resilient, post-pandemic future for all Filipinos. Through the annual Public Policy Conference, or ATPC, which is the main and culminating activity of the Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM, we wish to open the conversation on how we can pursue this reset and rebuild agenda in our respective sectors. To rebuild the country from the COVID-19 pandemic, Almost two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, nation and planet, everyone has a role to play. A caring and compassionate business sector is crucial. This means placing equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being and sustainability. The Academe should ensure that the new modes of delivering education and training under the new normal are accessible to all and will not widen economic and social inequalities. Schools should also improve their curriculum by imparting knowledge, skills, values and attitudes that promote social responsibility and environmental stewardship. Civil society must be relentless in pushing for a more accountable and responsive governance and sustainable business practices and bridge the gap between sectors that do not have access to government channels. Climate change has already severely affected the livelihood of most Filipinos, and the COVID-19 pandemic just worsened the situation. There is a need to strengthen measures to protect the environment and adopt climate resilience programs that will pave the way for a greener and bluer economy. The government must focus on setting the right policies to address the needs of the times. It must also improve the country's emergency preparedness, response, recovery, and rehabilitation. Lastly, the general public should reset its paradigms by adopting new practices at work, in learning, and in leisure that will help build resilience to adversities. Everyone must start living more responsibly by adopting more sustainable lifestyles. Individually, we should build our resilience so that collectively we can be stronger as a nation, ready to fight the next crisis. Overcoming the current pandemic requires a whole-of-society approach driven by solidarity and compassion and guided by data and evidence. Together, let us work toward a more caring business, a more nurtured environment, a more resilient, more inclusive, and more sustainable economy. Let us reset and rebuild for a better Philippines. taking via screenshot. Thea of the Secretariat will take the screenshot. Thea? Okay, good morning everyone, speakers and, pa and panelists. May, we, may I request for you to open your camera? Professor Lian, Kok, Lian Pinko, can you open your camera, sir? Okay. 
Okay. Um, for a moment. Okay, put on your best smile. One, two, three, smile. One more. Okay. Professor, Professor Lian Pinko, okay. There you go. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adora. Thank you, Thea. Okay, let's start. Green and inclusive recovery. That is our theme for today. And uh, let me briefly say a few words on this theme. Uh, there is no single description of a uh, green recovery, but the various characterizations by academics and international organizations point to accelerating climate action, tackling environmental crisis, and building resilience while creating jobs and addressing health and socioeconomic uh, inequities. This kind of uh, recovery requires uh, viewing climate targets as complementary to well-being targets and uh, being prepared with alternatives given that uh, trade-offs are on the horizon. We also view green recovery as inclusive recovery because there are concrete returns to health, job creation, income, and general socioeconomic well-being, especially for those who are left behind. The green and inclusive recovery theme also ties up closely with the previous two webinars on resetting capitalism and ethical business, which were held last week. These uh, last two webinars tackled environmental, social, and governance, or ESG metrics for businesses. And ESG metrics can also be the standards for checking how green and inclusive the recovery initiatives are. Moreover, making the post-pandemic recovery more green and inclusive provides opportunities for businesses and other stakeholders to create value that is beneficial for all. Our theme for today also helps frame the next and the last APPC webinar uh, on Thursday with a theme rob robust and the healthy workforce. Given that green jobs and improved well-being are expected outcomes from a green and inclusive recovery. To say more about our theme, we are honored to have with us today two international speakers on specific green and inclusive recovery topics and two speakers who will provide national perspectives. And I will introduce each of them before they speak. So without much further ado, let us start with the first exciting topic, tipping or turning point scaling up climate finance in the face of COVID-19, to be presented by Dr. German Velasquez. Dr. German, or Jerry to his friends, Velasquez, is the director of the Division of Mitigation and Adaptation of the Green Climate Fund, or GCF. This division that Dr. Velasquez heads provides expertise and technical support in climate change adaptation and mitigation. This includes the expertise on thoroughly understanding the incremental costs of low emission and climate resilient investments. He also reviews and assesses the pipeline of, of proposals for adaptation and mitigation activities to be financed by the GCF and assists developing countries and accredited entities in improving their readiness to access funding. Dr. Velasquez, the virtual platform is yours. Um, many thanks. Um, I would like to share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Can you see my screen? Oops, I think maybe I need to share a different screen. Share. Okay, I hope you can see the bigger screen. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my topic of my talk today is a tipping point or turning point, scaling climate finance in the face of COVID-19. Um, at this moment, I think we face a decision point in the fight against climate change because uh, what we decide today 
will either entrench our dependence on fossil fuels, leading us to possibly a tipping point on climate change, or it could be a turning point and help us achieve the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. Now, how do we convert this into a turning point? So only if climate action and COVID-19 stimulus measures are mutually supporting. If we do this, then uh, we are able to actually turn the tide. Now, this is the challenge for all of us. We cannot uh, solve one problem and create another. This is one thing that we're trying to avoid. However, to do this, countries need long-term affordable uh, climate finance or finance in general. And uh, at the moment, most, the G, most of the G20 countries do not yet prioritize green resilient investments. Now, if the G20 does not do this, you could imagine what's happening in the developing world wherein climate finance is severely undermined by um, the COVID-19 induced economic and financial crisis. So as of now, world's largest economies have committed close to 12 trillion to restart their economies, according to the IMF. The US, for example, have passed a 900 billion stimulus package with provisions to fight climate change, including all kinds of investments, including renewable energy and so on. But many countries are building out stimulus recovery plans that have failed to prioritize clean energy investments and policymakers and energy system participants are resorting to what they have done in the past. We have seen this before during the financial crisis in 2008, and it's playing out again. This is an example of, uh, this is from Vivid Economics uh, from the Guardian newspaper. So as you can see, the Philippines is uh, shown there in terms of its uh, economic uh, recovery, stimulus to COVID-19. The, the green bar is uh, the positive aspect and the, the red bar is the negative aspect. What we want is a net positive aspect. And as you can see here, very few countries, and, the, and by the way, the US is actually lower than the Philippines in that, uh, in that graph before President Biden. Uh, however, with the, the measures now under President Biden, it, they will be number one. So there's two US uh, um, points here. As you can see, based on this, aside from the US under President Biden, only four other countries, France, Spain, UK, and Germany, and the EU in general, have packages that will produce a net environmental benefit. Every other country is a net negative. So this is the challenge that we face. As you can see, uh, many, many countries, including in the same region as the Philippines, are actually far worse situation. Now, what drives this? Because this is fundamentally the challenge that we are trying to discuss. What drives this trend and what can we do? I'm going to discuss only one. There are many drivers, obviously. I'm going to discuss one because we have limited time. And that's the financial system. Now, the financial system is fundamentally short terministic. Its view is very short. And uh, the Risks are, some forms of risk in the financial system are well understood, for example, insurance. However, most uh, climate risks are not well understood or ignored. So, for example, a risk in the financial system is uh, viewed mainly in the short term. And maybe this is something that most of you who are in the system would know what drives this. Is it the quarterly bottom line analysis? Is what drives the, the system to actually view things in the short term? you know, is the short-term profit that really drives uh, the decisions? Is it the way that the investments are done? What drives this? Because uh, if, if, if we look, many investment banks that have access to the fossil fuel asset risks, they're well known. And most of these banks have known this for years. And still 35 banks in uh, the developed world invested 2.7 trillion in fossil fuels four years after the Paris Agreement uh, adoption. Why is this the case? So if, if the risks are known, why is it that uh, investors still invest in these uh, uh, risky uh, areas? Because we don't understand the risks. So there are three kinds of risks that climate change uh, brings to us. And uh, some are well understood than others. And then some even well understood, we don't act on them. Some we act, some we don't. So for example, transition risk. 
What is transition risk? This is the possibility that you invest on something, let's say fossil fuels, but then policy changes and then you are uh, then uh, forced to abandon it. So it's called, um, you know, stranded assets. So you fundamentally uh, invest on something that may not be viable in the future. So it's a, it's a risk that we know because uh, some policies are already being put in place. Now, the more stable the policy, the, the more stable the understanding of the risk. This is more or less known uh, globally, the transition risk. Litigation risk. Litigation risk is the risk that you might get sued because uh, most fossil fuel companies in the future might get sued uh, on this. And they know that risk and they carry that risk. The third risk that very few companies and the financial system in general does not understand is physical climate risk. This is the one that many uh, companies nor the financial system do not understand. They do not account for it. Of all the risks that they understand, this is the one that they don't understand the most. So it could impact 72 out of the 79 industries assessed by the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, equating to $27.5 trillion or 93% of the equities by market capitalization in the US alone. And it actually represents a systemic risk to stability. So much so that in the upcoming COP in, this, in November, one of the key things is uh, risk disclosure. So uh, the G20, the G7 have now made this uh, mandatory in some countries to disclose physical climate risk in the financial system, starting with banks. But uh, as you can see, this is something that has not yet uh, uh, been done in many parts of the world. And the main challenge here is that diversification does not eliminate climate risk because it affects most industries. You cannot just diversify your investments, you carry that risk. And most often you don't know that risk. This is Bangkok and this is the industrial parks. The dots are the industrial parks and the colors are the darker it is, it's the more dense the population. This is the floods in 2011 and as you can see, uh, the, the industrial parks are in most of the places where uh, the floods were. And uh, most of the people are also located in the flooded areas. This is an example of that place. Uh, after the floods, this is what happened. So you can see they're actually uh, using boats. So what happened here is that uh, most of these locations, this area used to be paddy fields, but because industrial parks were actually nearby and they actually generate jobs, so they actually, you know, converted it into housing estates. The industrial parks have three meter flood walls. Most of the housing estates have none. So what does that mean? So the risk, the climate risks are known, somewhat known, but never acted on and never shared. We did not share what to do with the risks that was created over time. So we created the risk jointly, public and private. And in this case, the public sector just paid for it. And that is the challenge that we are facing. So we need to price climate risks. It needs to be known in the impact of our own operation on our investment selection. It is very difficult because it is an estimation of many scenarios and the time horizon is very long. Uh, or, however, we are already seeing some uh, repricing of some assets, especially in energy, oil and gas. There is already repricing. Now, it will continue. This repricing of assets will continue uh, as much as we know more of these policies. So, um, um, you know, once policies are known, then uh, these repricing uh, will happen. For example, auto manufacturers who have been slow in the transition to electric vehicles are now suffering in their relative values. And it's happening in many places in the US and Europe. Uh, despite this, the IMF in 2019 found that equity valuation across countries did not reflect yet uh, climate change scenarios. So as you can see, investments are still done in the short term. So what will happen in the future? There could be instability in the future when this in fact uh, hits the system. So how can we make finance more sustainable? The public sector has a very clear role because the public sector measures the right things and sets the right targets. So that's the most important aspect, the NDCs, the policies, you know, the goals, aligning incentives to support better outcomes, driving socially useful innovation, promoting innovation that the public sector thinks are key. 
However, more importantly, we need to ensure capital acts for the long term. We cannot allow short terministic approaches only. Pricing capital according to the true cost of business activities. You know, we cannot act on things that we cannot measure. Of all the risks in finance, we don't understand climate risk. Why is that? We need to understand climate risk and the playing field needs to be uh, leveled. So it cannot just be, you know, burdened on one sector or one uh, area of the, of the sector because then you don't, you, you don't have a level play, playing field. And we need to innovate financial structures to better serve sustainable business. So it is already happening. Capital flows are changing in energy, for example. In 2010, you know, less than 4% are in uh, wind and solar. By 2019, 18%, it's a mature business. It will happen in the other sectors. We, we have seen it happen, it will happen. And you can see here, it's a short nine years. So it will happen in the other sector, transport, it will happen. So the only question is, when will this change happen? And will you be on what side when this happens? When costs fell dramatically in many countries, the cheapest source by 2020 is either solar or wind. We know this but there are barriers that actually stop us from uh, adopting more renewable energy. So I think you've already discussed this in previous webinars, the sustainable finance and the things that you can do, there are many things, but of course the most important is ESG integration because it's not just one. Uh, what we're discussing here is that uh, you cannot just be blind to one and create another problem. We need to look at the totality of uh, environment, society and economy. And uh, therefore, within environment, you have climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and other environmental issues. So from low carbon to climate to green, social, environmental, and sustainable. That's our goal, is to go all the way to sustainable. So I'm going to show a few examples of how do we make uh, recovery resilient. And on this aspect, uh, the Green Climate Fund stands ready to support the Philippines in developing these kind of projects. If the Philippines submit such projects to us, Green jobs. Korea, for example, proposes to invest 185 million in subsidies for home rooftop solar installation as part of its COVID-19 recovery. Um, improving transmission. In many countries, up to 30% of power are lost in transmission. New smart grid infrastructure can allow effective and less wasteful flow of power. Making hydrogen cheaper. This is more on research, but we have seen different approaches to actually use hydrogen. Uh, um, not just in the production side, but also in the use. How about industry? Cleaner materials. Now, it's very difficult to shift materials, So, but there are examples. In uh, California's Buy Clean Act, introduced low CO2 standards for materials across the state, and it can actually push greener options into the mainstream. So the government has a role. Pricing climate risk in industry, locking in accurate high cost of CO2 across all countries. There are some countries within Asia that's actually testing this, piloting this in specific industries voluntarily. Speeding up the internet is actually a very good thing to do as well in industry. Transportation, shifting sustainable public transportation is key, you know, because shift, avoid, and improve. When you cannot shift, you cannot avoid, you can improve. For promoting electric vehicles, building chargers, or maybe even green airline bailouts. Not just bailouts, green airline bailouts. Land use and ecosystems. We need to conserve irreplaceable carbon. The last thing we want is because as part of the recovery, we start cutting our forests. Just 15% of the world's forests remain intact. So we need to actually preserve our ecosystem because there are also our lungs. And there are many things that they could also do to actually you know, protect our um, recovery from, um, from the pandemic. Manage water, generates energy, feeds agriculture, keeps citizenry alive. Water infrastructure creates a lot of jobs. Promote ecotourism. Marine and coastal eco-preservation restoration for ecotourism might actually be the case because people feel safer to go as a tourist rather than in a regular, you know, touristic location. So ecotourism might be also a way of the future. Housing, energy efficient building retrofits, you know, because it is shovel ready, you can generate a lot of jobs and it can be done quickly. Uh, make green construction costs less. 11% of emissions are from building materials, cement, steel, and glass. Green rents. Jobs. Green jobs in renewable energy. And you know, you know investment, a million dollars on investment in renewable energy creates 
jobs as compared to 2.7 jobs in fossil fuel industry. Education, you know, we can use the pandemic time to actually retrain our you know, population, to re retool them so that they are ready after the pandemic into new skills. So that can also be done. So I'll stop there and I hope uh, we stand ready to support the Philippines if it would like to invest in these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. And uh, that's a very uh, uh, exciting uh, discussion on the very important ideas uh, on say how to make finance more sustainable. No? And uh, uh, it's uh, encouraging what is happening now in the energy sector, as you mentioned, and it will also happen in the other sectors. Uh, and uh, the various ideas on initiatives such as green jobs you know, will resonate well with the Philippine government, I'm sure. So now let's listen to another exciting topic, uh, how science can help inform policies and decisions on climate and biodiversity to be presented by Professor Cole Lian Pin. Professor Cole Lian Pin is an applied ecologist and a pioneer in low-cost uh, conservation drone technology. He brings uh, 16 years of international research experience in the field of sustainability and environmental science, having worked in institutions across uh, Switzerland, Australia, and the United States. In 2020, he returned to Singapore under the National Research Foundation's Returning Singaporean Scientist Scheme. His research focuses on developing policy-relevant science and science-based decision support tools to help reconcile humanity's needs with environmental protection. He is particularly interested in environmental issues in the developing tropics, a region where population growth is most rapid, yet the people are poorest and where biodiversity is the richest, yet most threatened globally. Professor Ko is one of the most highly cited conservation scientists in Asia, a TED global speaker, founding director of conservationdrones.org, and a World Economic Forum young global leader. Everyone, please help me give a warm virtual applause to Professor Ko. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Uh, allow me to share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Thank you. So a very good morning to all the esteemed and honorable participants of this uh, seventh annual Public Policy Conference. It is a pleasure and a privilege for me to have the opportunity today to learn from all of you. Um, I thought it was a very insightful uh, lecture from uh, Dr. Velasquez, Velasquez earlier and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, his presentation. Uh, I'm also very grateful to have the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the recent research from the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at the National University of Singapore. I think the sharing of knowledge, science and technology across academia, public and private sectors in our region will ensure that we can collectively and effectively address uh, these emerging climate and environmental threats that we are all facing, as well as to capitalize on the new opportunities that these challenges also present to us. Uh, indeed, my presentation today will focus on climate change as a wicked problem, uh, but I will also highlight some of the new opportunities we can look forward to uh, as well. I think many of us here might remember Secretary Rumsfeld uh, making his uh, infamous statement back in 2002. He was, of course, talking about a completely different context, but I think sometimes it's useful to think about the subject matter in terms of uh, what we know and what we know we don't know. So today I will break my presentation into three main parts. The first part is on what we know about climate change and nature-based solutions. The second part is on what we are beginning to find out. And the third part is on what we don't know, but urgently need to know. So what do we know? I think we know the problem quite well. If we take the 
annual average temperature of our planet over the past 170 years, color code them on a temperature scale of blue to red, indicating cooler to warmer temperatures, this is what we would see. If we look at the data for individual countries in our region, we see a very similar trend. So today, it is not controversial anymore that our climate has been getting increasingly warmer at local, regional, and global levels. I think we also know the cause of the problem quite well. It is simply the accumulation of CO2, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. The blue line you see here shows global annual emissions it is now close to about 40 billion tons per year. The pink line shows global carbon dioxide concentration. It is now over 400 parts per million in our atmosphere. So we know the problem, uh, we know the cause of the problem. I think we actually also know the solution. We basically have to reverse what we had done in the past 170 years by reducing our emissions to effectively zero. And according to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we need to do that within the next 30 years if we are to achieve the Paris Climate Goal of limiting global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and preferably below 1.5 degrees Celsius. In fact, we need to go below zero to also remove and reduce carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere. The blue lines you see on this uh, IPCC figure on the right indicate different pathways for achieving the Paris climate target. In fact, uh, Singapore, uh, my country, is very serious in taking a whole of nation approach to addressing climate change by committing to these ambitious targets. Now, earlier this year, the Singapore Parliament declared climate change a global emergency, along with a suite of green transformation and green growth strategies as part of the Singapore Green Plan 2030. Following that, the government also announced that Sentosa, one of Singapore's most famous tourist attractions, will become carbon neutral by 2030. And uh, following that as well, uh, Singapore Airlines uh, pledged to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So clearly, Singapore, along with many of our uh, uh, neighboring countries, is very serious in taking a whole of nation approach to addressing climate change by committing to these bold and ambitious uh, climate targets. However, given the very short runway ahead of us, uh, meeting these goals will not be easy. Thankfully, Singapore is not alone because at the global level, we also need to achieve net zero emissions by around mid-century if we are to meet the target of the Paris Climate Agreement. So to help us get started, let's go back to the IPCC pathways and zoom in on one of these pathways, which is pathway three you see here, uh, representing a middle of the road scenario. For the world to achieve net zero by around mid-century, we will have to peak our emissions by 2021, followed by rapid decarbonization, which is the gray part of the pathway. But more importantly, we also need to act on the brown parts of the pathway. The brown part above the zero line represents opportunities over the next 10 years or so to reduce emissions, mainly by avoiding deforestation. The brown part below the zero line are opportunities for us to remove emissions mainly by reforesting or rehabilitating our degraded ecosystems. And together, these are the so-called nature-based climate solutions. Nature-based climate solutions are not only important, but they are also recognized to be an integral part of the solution. Uh, they are baked into every IPCC pathway for us to achieve the Paris Climate Goal. In other words, even if we manage to decarbonize, to act on the gray part of these pathways, we could still fall short of our targets unless we also figure out the science and the practice of implementing these uh, nature-based solutions, the brown part of every pathway. Let's move on to part two. Uh, what are we beginning to find out? 
This is another famous person you may recognize. Uh, numbers don't lie, as uh, Dr. Fauci famously said, but numbers do and uh, can and do change over time as we improve our understanding of the world through science. So what I'm about to present to you are some preliminary research and findings from our research. Um, these initial insights can be helpful and useful uh, for us to understand what we should be focusing on and where some of the opportunities and risks might lie. Let's start with the issue of scale. What is the scale of our solution versus the scale of our problem? As I mentioned earlier, uh, global carbon emissions is currently at about close to 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. Here I've also included the annual emissions of China, the United States, Indonesia, and Singapore for comparison. Recent research from our center at NUS uh, shows that by protecting threatened forests across the tropics, we can avoid the loss of almost 2 billion tons of CO2 per year. This is greater than the uh, emissions of Indonesia and Singapore combined. Our research also shows that by protecting threatened mangrove forests alone, uh, we can avoid the loss of some 30 million tons of CO2 per year. But that is not all. If we focus just on the urban environment, cities, our research shows that across some uh, 7,600 cities worldwide, there are almost 11 million hectares of urban green spaces that are potentially available for reforestation. And if we do reforest these green spaces in these cities, they can contribute to carbon sequestration at a rate of about 80 million tons of CO2 per year at the global level. So the take home message here is forest protection and reforestation, including in cities, uh, are an important part of our climate change mitigation strategy. Now, from the perspective of a policymaker or an investor, it, it may not be enough to know what the potential is. Uh, we also need to know where the potential lies. And so we also produced a carbon prospecting map to show where in the world one can invest in forest protection to avoid carbon emissions. As you can see on this map, much of the potential lies in South America and Southeast Asia. In fact, Indonesia and Malaysia are among the top five countries in the world where we can avoid the most emissions by protecting their forests. From a biodiversity and nature conservation perspective, this map is also very interesting because it tells us where forests in the world uh, are under threat and where we can potentially invest to avoid the loss of both carbon and biodiversity by protecting these forests. Interestingly, if we focus only on mangrove forests, as, as this other map from uh, our research shows, we find that, that the bulk of this blue carbon, so-called blue carbon potential, is also found in our region of Southeast Asia. Blue carbon simply means a carbon uh, that is stored or, can be, or that can be captured from marine ecosystems, particularly coastal ecosystems. This is actually not surprising given that we uh, live in an archipelagic region with lots of islands and coastlines uh, where there are still lots of mangrove forests under threat of loss and, uh, and as well as uh, under uh, a lot of other associated environmental impacts. However, it is important to note that not all of these investable carbon projects are profitable carbon projects because uh, like any other economic activity, a carbon project's financial viability uh, depends on a wide range of factors, including the price of carbon and the costs of establishing, maintaining, and operating uh, the carbon project. In fact, our research shows that the financial return on investment from these carbon projects can be quite substantial. Now, based on very conservative carbon pricing scenarios, we find that the Asia-Pacific region, particularly Southeast Asia, has the highest concentration of the most profitable carbon projects, 
which can generate return on investment at close to 25 billion US dollars in net present values per year, every year for the next 30 years. Indonesia alone can generate about $10 billion per year. But what I find uh, most interesting on this map and, and perhaps also most worrying are the yellow parts on the map. Uh, these are the regions that will not be financially viable as carbon projects, uh, mainly because these forests do not generate enough carbon credits to offset the costs of establishing and maintaining these forests as carbon projects. And so from a nature conservation perspective, uh, we urgently need other policy interventions to protect the vast majority of our threatened forests across the tropics. In this earlier slide, I also mentioned that the uh, reforestation of our urban green spaces can also be a kind of nature-based climate solution. So if we, so, so we also conducted a spatially explicit analysis of cities. Now, interestingly, we find that not all cities in the world would benefit equally from the reforestation of their green spaces. In fact, cities with the greatest carbon sequestration potential are concentrated in the tropics, especially in Central and South America, coastal West Africa, uh, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Another interesting finding from our study is that although the climate change mitigation potential of urban reforestation may be limited at the global level, uh, urban reforestation can be particularly important for some cities. For example, we find that for about 1,200 cities worldwide, the reforestation of their available green spaces can offset more than 25%, more than a quarter of the city's local carbon emissions. Another important consideration is that the theoretical potential for climate change mitigation uh, can be quite different from what they may be uh, actually achievable on the ground, because there will always be practical constraints that are specific to the local or regional contexts that need to be considered. To talk about constraints, let me uh, focus on reforestation as a climate change solution. Now, recently, we also mapped the uh, climate change, uh, the potential for reforestation in Southeast Asia in general. We find that in our region, uh, there are about 121 million hectares of degraded forests, uh, peat swamp forests, and mangrove forests that are biophysically suitable for reforestation. The restoration of these degraded lands could potentially remove about 3.4 billion tons of CO2 per year. However, these so-called degraded lands in our region may in fact uh, be in use by local communities as smallholder farmlands or home gardens. Appropriating these lands for reforestation may compromise the livelihoods, the food security, and the land rights of these land users. Now, furthermore, a reforestation may require constant site maintenance and protection of these forest projects against uh, threats such as uh, tree diebacks from diseases, illegal logging, and forest fires. We find that as we start to apply these different layers of considerations and constraints, the picture starts to change very quickly as well. The amount of land that is practically available for reforestation can quickly shrink from what we thought would be about 120 million hectares to, uh, realistically speaking, less than 2 million hectares across the region. And in the most constrained scenario, reforestation re would remove less than 0 0.25 billion tons of CO2 per year, which is uh, literally a fraction of the uh, unconstrained theoretical potential. So why should we care about these new knowledge and insights? These insights are important because they tell us where there might be opportunities for countries in Asia and, our, and, and companies in Asia to reduce and remove our emissions, or perhaps even invest in generating a nature-based carbon offset credits to capitalize on new economic opportunities. But just as importantly, 
the science can also alert us to what some of the constraints and risks might be, constraints that are specific to our region. Given that uh, Southeast Asia, Singapore, and many of our neighboring countries, including the Philippines, have such an intimate knowledge of the socioeconomic, the cultural, and geopolitical context of our region, it makes good sense for us collectively to invest in producing the policy relevant science and to serve as a collective knowledge hub for climate solutions for our region. Let's uh, move on to part three. Uh, for the next few slides, I will uh, run you through uh, some examples uh, of uh, the priority research that we are tackling in our center uh, over the next uh, months and years. Nature-based solutions in general uh, are important, uh, not just for carbon storage and sequestration, but also for the multiple co-benefits they can deliver to society, uh, including biodiversity conservation, water purification, safeguarding our food security, uh, help with flood regulation, and so on. Another piece of ongoing research at our center is focused on mapping these various co-benefits of nature-based solutions across Southeast Asia to better inform our climate and land use policies and decisions. And of course, uh, green spaces in cities, in our cities, uh, also provide multiple co-benefits, including uh, conserving our urban wildlife, uh, maintaining our physical and mental well-being, improving social cohesion, as well as reducing our exposure to, uh, to air pollutants, uh, noise, and heat. Among the many co-benefits of nature-based solutions, biodiversity is particularly interesting because it is both a co-benefit and a building block of healthy ecosystems. When we invest in protecting a forest, we protect its biodiversity. Conversely, a high diversity of animals, plants, and microbes in the forest ensures that the forest continues to perform its ecosystem functions, not only to sustain itself, but also to deliver ecosystem services to humans, including, of course, the services of carbon sequestration and storage. Now, this value of biodiversity is currently not properly reflected or internalized in carbon pricing. At the moment, one ton of carbon from a monoculture can be priced the same as one ton of carbon from a highly diverse, a pristine rainforest. But we know intuitively that carbon from a pristine rainforest is so much more valuable than carbon from the monoculture. And so our center is also exploring ways to quantify this price premium of what we call a beautiful carbon. So far, we have focused on green carbon, which are terrestrial forests, and blue carbon, which are the mangroves and the seagrass meadows and so on. But there are also several other kinds of high carbon ecosystems in the carbon rainbow uh, that have received less attention, including teal carbon, which are the freshwater swamp forests and peat swamp forests, as well as gold carbon, which are the macroalgae or seaweeds. And more importantly, we need to understand the interconnectedness and the interdependence between these ecosystems to fully appreciate the climate change mitigation potential and co-benefits that these other high carbon ecosystems provide. It is partly because of the many benefits of nature-based solutions that nature-based carbon offsets are the most highly sought after product in voluntary carbon markets today. In fact, nature-based carbon credits are three times more expensive than renewable energy offsets. Given the growing global demand for nature-based carbon offsets, Singapore is positioning itself as a global trading hub for carbon-related services with a focus on nature-based carbon projects and products. <clears throat> nature-based climate solutions are promising, but they are certainly not without risks. Now, earlier this year, there have been several controversial media reports on how certain suppliers of forest carbon credits may have been selling 
meaningless carbon offsets to big corporations, uh, offsets that don't actually deliver any additional climate mitigation benefits. At our centre, we are also working hard to understand and reduce these risks of nature-based uh, carbon offsets and projects. Here's a typology of the risks of nature-based carbon projects. Now, I won't go into details except to say that these risks include uh, inaccuracies in the estimates of carbon stocks and, se and, and sequestration rates, uncertainty in the uh, value add of the intervention of, uh, of the carbon project, uncertainties uh, around the permanence or impermanence of projects and products, and the potential leakage of environmental impacts. Now, together, these risks can affect the credibility of the projects and the environmental integrity of its products. Having said that, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, as uh, we had discussed earlier, nature-based climate solutions are essential for us to achieve the Paris Climate Goal. And carbon finance is a promising way of shifting capital to fund forest protection and reforestation efforts. But not all carbon projects are effective uh, and, 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 uh, and, and successful, which is why we need carbon accounting methodologies and standards to ensure the credibility and integrity of nature-based carbon projects and products. Only then can we ensure a stable supply of high quality carbon credits to meet uh, market demands. This is exactly what our centre is uh, currently focused on through a new research program called Nature for Climate, which seeks to leverage the opportunity that nature-based solutions provide uh, to achieve our common uh, desired outcome. So in the first part of this presentation, I have uh, shared some of the research that our centre at NUS uh, has been involved in over the past few months. I will now uh, switch gears uh, for the last few slides to talk a bit about uh, who we actually are. The Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions is a new research facility at NUS in Singapore. Uh, the centre has two main goals. The first is to produce data-driven science to inform uh, climate policies, decisions, and actions in Singapore and the region. The second and equally important goal is to empower leadership in our public, private and people sectors by building capacity for us to respond to climate challenges and opportunities. Uh, with this centre, we are bringing together researchers from across different disciplines, departments, faculties and even universities to pool our resources and expertise to work towards our common goal. Uh, the research interests and expertise of the center's researchers are very diverse. They include marine biology, mangrove ecology, uh, spatial prioritization, uh, as well as environmental policy, governance, and law. The center invests in uh, five strategic areas of research. Uh, I will not go into details, except to say that they are respectively uh, to understand the impacts of climate change, to identify solutions, to uh, find ways of overcoming barriers and risks uh, to the implementation of our solutions, uh, to use science to, get the prior to guide the prioritization of our actions, and also to leverage technology uh, for us to get the biggest bang for our buck. We employ a wide range of research techniques, uh, including lab work, field work, and remote sensing. And these data sets that we collect uh, are critical for our work to map to monitor and to inform the optimization and prioritization of solutions. Uh, this is just a timeline of our ongoing research program. Um, in addition to research, our center is also proactively working with uh, local partners for outreach and public education activities. And of course, we can't do any of this alone. Uh, so we engage with stakeholders from across academia, government, corporate and the NGO sectors to both uh, and, and both locally and internationally to collaborate and leverage on our respective strengths and to achieve our goals. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, time and for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ko. Uh, it's good that uh, you tied up your ideas on uh, nature-based solutions as uh, something fit for climate finance or carbon finance, uh, which was uh, discussed by uh, 
uh, our previous speaker. The visuals, uh, I must say, are particularly striking and uh, I think will prompt uh, concerned decision makers to action. Uh, for example, the, the peak of emissions in 2021. So we're peaking and then rapid uh, decarbonization should happen uh, immediately, uh, mainly by avoiding deforestation, then reforestation, which are examples of uh, uh, nature-based solutions. And uh, uh, the visuals also on the green and blue carbon prospecting maps, the ecosystems in the carbon rainbow. And uh, I'm reminded of an opinion article on a possible ASEAN Green New Deal uh, saying these uh, nature-based uh, activities are major important activities in ASEAN should, should such kind of a Green New Deal uh, push through. Okay, so at this point, uh, to provide national perspectives, uh, please help me welcome two distinguished panelists, one from the private sector and one from the government. Our first panelist is uh, Mr. John Eric uh, T. Francia, President and Chief Executive Officer of the AC Energy Holdings Incorporated. Under his leadership, Ayala established its energy platform from a standing start in 2011 to become one of the largest renewable energy platforms in Southeast Asia with over 2,000 megawatts of attributable renewables capacity. Eric, to his friends, is also a managing director and member of the management committee of Ayala Corporation since 2009 and was appointed as a chairman of uh, Ayala's Investment Committee in 2021. He is also a director of various Ayala Group companies, including AC Infrastructure, AC Health, AC Ventures, and as chairman and CEO of AC NXOR. Eric earned a master's degree in management studies at the University of Cambridge in the UK, graduating first class honors. He received his undergrad degree in humanities and political economy from the University of Asia and the Pacific, graduating magna cum laude. Friends, help me welcome Mr. Eric Francia. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Edith, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank yes, you. okay, G great. Uh, thank you very much and a uh, good, good morning to, to everyone, to all the government uh, leaders, uh, private sector, uh, the civil society, uh, and, and to my fellow uh, panelists. Uh, uh, it's great to hear Dr. Jerry and Professor Ko. Uh, these ideas are very much in line with uh, our direction at AC Energy and the broader Ayala Group uh, here on the ground in the Philippines. And I would love to, to share with you, uh, bringing it closer to, to home in terms of what we're seeing and what we are focusing on in, in the, uh, uh, this important topic of climate change. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, just to summarize uh, the key messages, key messages I'd like to share in the next 15 minutes or so. Number one, I think uh, it's been discussed uh, in industry circles that we are facing in the Philippines a tight power supply situation, which is quite ironic given the pandemic. And number two, there is opportunity for renewable energy to help address these supply challenges. And, and even foster the green-led recovery. Uh, I will hopefully uh, share some of uh, key insights along those lines. Number three, quite importantly, there are already government policies in place to enable this uh, so-called green-led recovery and renewable energy scale-up, although we still need to see effective execution and enforcement of these uh, policies. Last but not least, it was also covered in this uh, uh, with us uh, lectures this morning. The ESG oriented capital is helping spur private sector investments in sustainable infrastructure. And again, AC Energy would like to play a leading role uh, to that end. Uh, next slide just gives us a very brief summary or picture of uh, where we've been over the last three years, uh, even during the pre pandemic uh, 2019 figures. Uh, this is a very interesting and compelling uh, story here. This is the focus on Luzon, which is uh, the largest uh, in, in the Philippines in terms of power demand. If you just focus on the first quarter, January to March, and look at the dark gray bar, that is the 2019 peak demand in Luzon. And 
if you see where, where 2020 was headed, the light gray bar, just look at the jam to March. 2020 was actually registering already a very strong demand relative to prior year 2019. Remember, this was pre-April lockdown, right, which is the onslaught really of the pandemic. In March, for example, the peak demand already grew by close to 10%, a staggering 10%. I can just imagine the horror of, of the tightness of capacity uh, during the summer of uh, uh, 2020 had the pandemic not struck. Not that I'm wishing for it, but that was one of the silver linings that, that uh, gave reprieve to, to, the, to the power uh, supply system. And if you look at uh, 2021, which is the blue line, it is already above the 2019 or the pre-pandemic, the so-called pre-pandemic levels, but still below the potential, which is the pre-pandemic 2020, right? And then if you look at post-March, uh, again, you, you see the precipitous drop uh, in the light gray line. Uh, but the interesting uh, tidbit here is that if you look at the blue line uh, relative to the dark gray, which is 2019, 2021 is already at or even slightly above 2019 or the so-called pre-pandemic uh, levels. The, the drop in April was due to the hard lockdown that we had uh, in April. But now, more or less, we are back to, to where we were in 2019, uh, if not slightly more. Next page, please. Now, having said that, uh, notwithstanding the recovery in demand, in power demand, which is the good news, uh, there has been some tightness in supply in the power sector. On the left-hand side, you will see the increased rate of outage of coal plants, uh, again, focused on Luzon. In 2016, outage rates were in the 14% uh, level, planned and unplanned, but in, uh, it, it creeps up uh, consistently. And in the uh, early part of 2021, this has reached a 20 plus percent uh, level, leading to really the tightness in, in supply, especially if you couple it with uh, the recovery in demand. Uh, coal plants uh, account for about half of our uh, uh, capacity needs. On the right-hand side, what accounts for 30% of Luzon needs is the gas plants uh, that, that draw from Malampaya. And we all know that Malampaya has been restricted uh, year-to-date, which is already potentially cognizant of the long-term decline, which was widely uh, expected starting in 2022. One could argue that that decline has already started uh, and this chart uh, shows, again, the marked drop uh, year to date. So that also contributed to the tightness in supply. And hence, on the next page, you see a summary, uh, a long-term summary, next page, please, of the uh, spot prices, which is a signal in terms of the supply-demand uh, balance or imbalance. You will see here the last uh, 12 years from 2010 to year to date uh, 2021, uh, where the spot market reached a high of six pesos and a low of uh, 278 in 2016, which is a normal year, but of course, uh, 2020 COVID year of 237. Long-term average is close to four pesos, and you will see that in 2019 and in 2020, uh, sorry, 2021, which is, by the way, still living through a pandemic, uh, prices have approached close to five pesos per kilowatt hour which is among the highest in the last uh, 12 years, which really signals to us that there is tightness uh, of supply uh, and demand. Uh, again, in the midst of going through this uh, pandemic, uh, it's just unbelievable to see these uh, prices. The, the next page uh, shows us uh, the, the key uh, challenges uh, in the short to medium term uh, facing uh, the, the, power, the, the power sector faces. And I could summarize it in, in five points. Number one, as I mentioned, Malampaya in decline. We need to replace this uh, probably with LNG. There are companies already uh, pursuing that. Number two, there are construction delays. Uh, we already saw uh, in the news about the delay uh, because of COVID restrictions and restrictions to get the technical foreign uh, uh, advisors uh, of one major uh, power plant, GN uh, Unit 2. Uh, that's 668 uh, megawatts that may uh, not make it uh, this this coming summer. We're still hoping that, that it will, but there's a risk of, uh, uh, of further delay. And number three, it was mentioned earlier that the grid constraints, especially uh, if we are going to inject 
more renewables, more variable electricity, uh, we need to upgrade and, and strengthen the grid. And right of way has been uh, an, a, a nagging issue uh, over the last uh, few years, uh, slowing down the rollout uh, of, of the national grid. Number four, uh, the aging of power plants. We, we have a lot of uh, power plants that were built in the 80s and 90s, and, and therefore the, decli the declining reliability as I showed in the previous slides. And number five, the strong rebound in, in fuel price and, and the volatility. Uh, again, in, in a world where the world is headed towards net zero, what will happen to the uh, global supply of fossil fuel and so forth? So that calls uh, for more uh, uh, focus uh, for the country to, 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 to have an energy resiliency and independence uh, uh, stance. So those are the, the short to medium term uh, challenges that, that beset uh, our power uh, sector. Uh, next page. Uh, there is a silver lining, uh, and and this is also consistent with the theme today, which is uh, renewable energy has a very significant role uh, to play, at least in the next decade. Uh, uh, from the point of view of Ayala, when we entered this market ten years ago, we always wanted to uh, focus and and invest big on renewables, but at that time it wasn't possible because renewables was still uh, not cost effective and unreliable a decade ago. But that picture has significantly changed. Uh, and now uh, I truly believe that this is the decade for renewables to, to, to scale up. And the good news is that the, the high level government policy or at least a stated goal of getting renewables back up in terms of a share of output uh, where it is today, which is 21%, uh, the, the government has already uh, um, reinforced the goal of getting renewables to 35% of output by 2030. <clears throat> we were already there once upon a time uh, back in uh, 2008 when the RE law was enacted. Renewables was already at 34% share of output. However, it dropped all the way to 21% uh, because of uh, the coal plants being built up uh, over the last decade to, to serve the strong uh, electricity demand in the Philippines in a cost-effective and reliable uh, manner. So in the next um, uh, 10 years, if we are going to achieve a 35% share of output on the left-hand side, you will see how much renewables uh, should grow uh, in terms of terawatt hours or in terms of output, it has to triple from 22 terawatt hours of uh, renewables in 2019 to around 60 terawatt hours or 60 billion kilowatt hours of renewable output uh, by 2030. That's the simple mathematics uh, of, of, of our power supply and demand. On the next page, next page please. We, we, we believe that it is doable. <clears throat> and what it means is that we really need to um, uh, scale up our renewable investments <clears throat> and we believe that we need to build around 20 gigawatts or 20,000 megawatts of renewable energy over the next uh, decade. We think that this is going to be driven by solar and wind which was also consistent uh, with Dr. Jerry's presentation this morning. Uh, but of course, it's going to have to be a portfolio, a hydro, geothermal, and biomass will have a role to play. But the reality is uh, it's likely going to be a solar-driven uh, scale-up uh, supported by wind and other uh, sources uh, as well. And, and, and because of the lower capacity factor of, of solar, the typical capacity factor is in the uh, 16 to 18 uh, percent in this part of the world at least then you really need to, to build up a lot of megawatts to make up for that uh, low capacity factor. Uh, on the next, uh, next page, please. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we think that the solar driven uh, uh, renewable <clears throat> transition, energy transition uh, makes sense. Number one, it's solar now is the lowest uh, cost of, levelized cost of uh, electricity, very competitive to uh, relative to coal and to gas. Uh, although there's a caveat there that you need to complement this with battery storage, which is the, the limiting factor 
uh, today, but hopefully that will be resolved over the next <clears throat> three to five years in terms of economics and scalability. Solar is very flexible. You can build solar practically anywhere, even rooftops, as we very well know. It's very predictable. Um, and, and the intermittency, as I mentioned, can be uh, addressed by battery storage. And it produces at the right time of the day and the year when we have peak demand. Uh, peak demand uh, in the Philippines is around uh, 2 p.m. Uh, uh, also at uh, 10 or 11 a.m., there's, there's high demand. And that is when uh, solar produces most. And during the year, uh, during summer, uh, between uh, March to June, uh, is also the peak demand in the Philippines, and that is when solar also produces most uh, during the year. And solar has outperformed expectations in our neighboring countries like Vietnam uh, and uh, bro broader, uh, more broadly speaking, in the Asia Pacific, uh, Australia, India, China. These are staggering numbers uh, beyond the expectations of people in terms of uh, solar installations. Uh, and for the record, Philippines is only uh, around one gigawatt of uh, installation of solar. So there is a strong upside here. Uh, on the right hand, hand side, it's just a simulation in terms of how the, the load curves will look like. As I mentioned, uh, this is a, a typical uh, daily load uh, curve in the zone with uh, the peak uh, consumption sometime around 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock uh, p.m., uh, as you can see. And the orange bar here is a simulation. If you added 10 gigawatts of, of solar, uh, that basically uh, addresses a lot of your peak demand. And then you can overbuild uh, the solar, add another 5 gigawatts, let's say, on top of the 10 gigawatts. And you can store that during the day <clears throat> and release it uh, at night. So you will see in the 6 o'clock to, to 12 o'clock here, that light orange bar is when you, you uh, release solar. So uh, as a result, you will have a, a, this light gray uh, area here is the area that has to be um, provided for, uh, uh, supplied by thermal, particularly the coal and the gas plants. And you will see a relatively flat uh, curve. And that's what we meant by uh, flattening the curve, which is good for thermal because you don't want to be cycling uh, a lot of your uh, thermal plants, especially the coal plants. So again, uh, this is an opportunity for, for the country to, to really address our supply challenges. But the key also is how to scale up solar and, and, and be ready when the storage, battery storage in particular, uh, becomes competitive and, and scalable. Uh, right now, battery storage is in the $250,000 to $300,000 per megawatt hour uh, uh, total capex. Uh, we, we would like to see that go down closer to $100,000 per megawatt hour uh, to, to be econom economically competitive to use it as load shifting as shown in this right hand uh, chart. Next page, please. Now, to, to uh, substantiate the goal of the government to, to get to the 35% uh, target by 2030, uh, one of the more important or critical policies that the government has is known as the Renewable Portfolio Standards, which is already a part of the Renewable Energy uh, Law. Uh, it is an important uh, enabler. It, it basically is a quota system that requires market participants, uh, including distribution utilities and uh, retail electricity providers, to source a certain percentage of their electricity demand from new renewable sources. So it's a forcing uh, mechanism. Uh, right now, officially, it, it has been set at the minimum uh, parameter, which is a 1% annual uh, increment, uh, which translates to a required uh, build that you see on the left-hand side. Uh, this is the, based on the projections and the, the parameters that the DOE has set. Um, this would require around 2.6 or 2,600 megawatts of new build by 2024. Uh, and then in successive years, you see the, the projected requirements, assuming a 23% capacity factor, uh, i.e. Uh, a renewable portfolio that's driven by solar and, and then wind, and then a little bit of uh, a biomass, geothermal, and hydro. Uh, unfortunately, the current policy will only get us to 26% renewable share of 
output. So what DOE is uh, considering now, and the good news is they're already conducting uh, uh, public consultations to, to move to increase that annual increment from 1% to 2.52% by 2023 in order to ensure that we get to the 35% renewable share of output by 2030. And if we make the simulations based on forecasts of electricity growth and so forth, moving such policy, that parameter from 1% to 2.52% will now require this kind of build, again, assuming a 23% capacity factor on the right-hand side, you will see that the system, the country will have to build incremental uh, 1,800 or 1 1.8 gigawatts of renewable uh, capacity, and then it peaks at uh, 4.5 gigawatts in 2024, and then two to three gigawatts every year thereafter. And, and this is where the cumulative 20 gigawatts uh, of, of renewables uh, come into play if you just add uh, the, the numbers on the right-hand side, and that would get us to 35% share of output. So the policy is already there. Um, well, uh, DOE has to finalize the 2.52% annual increment. We're hopeful, we're closely watching uh, this uh, important uh, policy. Hopefully that will be formalized uh, sometime soon. Next page, uh, please. Now, there are other enabling or complementary policies uh, that will support the, the, the overarching goal of getting to 35% renewables share of output by 2030 and the main policy mechanism or policy lever, which is the RPS or renewable portfolio standards. The first thing you see here is a green energy option, which is the specific mechanism that the government is planning to implement in support of the RPS. So basically it is, uh, the, the latest thinking is to do some kind of a feed-in tariff system where the, the generators will sell to the grid and be promised a feed-in tariff, except that the difference here is that the generators will have to bid through an auction uh, and whoever has the lowest uh, tariff will qualify for this uh, green energy auction or a modified uh, feed-in tariff. So we're hopeful that the the policy will be and the mechanism will be implemented in a timely uh, fashion. We're also hopeful that the government will shape the rules and parameters of this mechanism of the green energy auction to make sure that it is encouraging the serious bidders uh, with the real financial and technical capability. Of course, what we've seen in other markets is that uh, uh, there are bidders and there are bidders and what we don't want are bidders who will not uh, push through uh, with our projects. So we're hopeful that the parameters uh, will be uh, stringent uh, and, and, and uh, um, reasonable enough and that the penalties and the performance bonds, for example, uh, will, be, uh, will, will, will make sure that the bidders uh, follow through with their commitments. The, the second uh, enabling policy or complementary policy here is a green energy option program, which lowers the threshold already of the ability of suppliers to be able to sell to customers. Right now, the retail competition is limited to 500 kilowatts uh, customers, so it's a limited market. But with if you are selling renewable energy, you can already sell up to 100 kilowatt uh, customers, which which increases the market size, especially for green energy uh, providers. So again, it is a, a significant uh, enabling policy to encourage uh, renewable energy providers like AC Energy uh, to, to, to address a broader uh, market. The, the bottom policies here are also important uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to, to create the right markets. Uh, renew renewable energy certificate market is, is an important one because it will <clears throat> allow basically a, a trading of the green attributes of their, or the renewable energy certificates that are produced by various renewable energy power plants that are not necessarily uh, supplying uh, it, with respect to the feed-in tariff or the green energy auction. So we need to be able to enable that as an al alternative uh, outlet uh, for companies, uh, for renewable energy companies, 
those who do not win or do not wish to participate in the green energy auction should have other uh, venues to encourage them uh, to, to build renewable plants anyway. So we're also hopeful that this uh, REC uh, market will also be implemented in a timely uh, fashion. It is a low hanging fruit uh, that should be uh, pretty straightforward and hopefully that will be implemented soon. Uh, last but not least uh, here <clears throat> uh, is the reserve market. This is not necessarily uh, explicitly connected to renewables, but in an indirect and important uh, manner, it is actually. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, renewables need to be complemented by battery technology uh, to, to firm or to com uh, complement or address the variable nature of renewables or the intermittent uh, nature. Uh, right now, there is no reserve uh, market, so uh, it is difficult to make investment decisions, for example, on battery storage. But with the reserve market, it is like having a spot market, albeit for electricity. Uh, companies like us will be able to take our own view of the market and build the capacity ahead of uh, an expected demand, knowing that there will be a market to sell to. So I think it's very important for, for the, the, the government or regulators to enforce the reserve market. We have been talking about this over the last decade or so, but we're still waiting for that reserve market uh, to, to, to happen. And it will really spur more investments, especially in battery storage or ancillary capacity if we had this open and transparent reserve market. So these are just four uh, of many enabling policies uh, uh, out there, but I think that these are worthwhile uh, to, to, to call out uh, for a call to action to really enable this green-led uh, recovery. The, the next page is my final slide just on the private sector uh, aspect. Uh, assuming and, and given uh, the, these developments on the regulatory uh, front, uh, there is already very strong uh, appetite uh, uh, we've already seen a lot of the local uh, major uh, power companies announcing plans to invest big in renewables. This is also supported by the global, uh, in the global uh, market, the backdrop of the very strong demand for green social bonds, sustainability-oriented uh, investments. And you've seen green and social bonds skyrocket in the last five years, growing 11-fold from a 50 billion <clears throat> global um, size to over 570 billion uh, of issued green and social bonds uh, in, in, in 2020. And we see that uh, growing uh, significantly uh, still. AC Energy, for example, uh, recently raised a $400 million fixed for life uh, perpetual green bond uh, that we successfully um, launched uh, and completed earlier this month. And it was uh, over five times oversubscribed, really showing the strong interest in green bonds and sustainable investments uh, in, in this part of the world. Uh, and then finally, <clears throat> the last point here is that with, with all of these opportunities in front of us in terms of scaling up renewable investments in, in the country, assuming that we really get to the 20 gigawatts of renewable build out over the next decade, given that uh, one megawatt of uh, renewables average around $1 million. It's lower for solar and higher for wind and other technologies. Uh, the rough estimate here is uh, we should be seeing well over $20 billion worth of investments on renewables alone, not including storage. Storage is another upside that could add another 20 to 30 percent of this uh, figure uh, within the decade and create over 50,000 uh, jobs uh, in direct employment. Uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, I think by Dr. Jerry that renewable jobs have a multiplier effect of 7.5 times. So you can imagine the significant impact as well in this uh, green-led recovery. So uh, yeah, a um, uh, little bit of word on AC Energy. Uh, we, we are uh, committed to, to drive uh, to, to also take a leading effort in this green-led recovery. Uh, we do have around 2,100 megawatts of renewables in our portfolio today, uh, which is uh, one of the largest in Southeast Asia. We have a goal of getting this uh, past 5,000 megawatts of renewables by 2025. Uh, more than 80% of our portfolio in our listed uh, company, AC Energy Corporation, uh, is on renewables. 
and we're, we're hoping <clears throat> to get this even to a higher uh, percentage as we have a program to divest our coal plants and reinvest the proceeds to help uh, scale up and accelerate our renewables expansion. So let me leave it uh, uh, here and happy to take uh, uh, questions during our open forum later on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Francia. And uh, we're glad to have an in industry practitioner with us today. Thank so, you. Uh, glad that uh, you pointed out that the renewable energy investments is an important uh, green recovery initiative and uh, that also uh, is tied up uh, tightly with the previous uh, two uh, presentations and uh, more importantly uh, with the uh, green uh, finance, uh, climate finance. Um, it's also striking uh, the urgent, uh, striking that you uh, emphasize uh, that goal now we have to triple by 2030 uh, the RE output to get to the 35 percent RE share in the generation mix so there's a sense of urgency in that and yeah. um, your conclusion on uh, on solar uh, given that battery storage to address intermittency is still the major limiting factor uh, I must say that that's also the PIDS conclusion in the uh, upcoming economic policy monitor chapter on this uh, APPC team. No? Uh, we concluded that uh, to help in the medium to long-term energy transition, um, perhaps uh, R&D incentives for battery storage research can be granted. And there's a proposed uh, science for change bill in uh, uh, which aims to significantly increase R&D spending in the uh, we're hoping that uh, that can be an opportunity to push for that. Absolutely. Thank you for your, thank you for your ideas. Thank now you. let's uh, proceed to the second panelist. Um, Secretary Emmanuel uh, uh, de Guzman uh, is uh, supposed to be with us uh, personally, but uh, he is in a budget hearing. So it's, it's budget uh, uh, hearing at, uh, season again in the Philippines. So he's there. Uh, de defending the budget of the Climate Change Commission. But uh, he has a recorded video of uh, uh, his reactions to the theme, to the topics, and uh, uh, the questions uh, uh, for uh, him and for the Climate Change Commission uh, will be addressed during the open forum by uh, the Secretary's representative. Uh, he is uh, Mr. Ludwig Federigan, the Acting Chief of the Information and Knowledge Management Division of the Climate Change Commission. So before we play Secretary de Guzman's uh, video, let me formally introduce uh, the Secretary. Uh, Sec uh, de Guzman, or Manny to his friends, is an international expert on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation a public health specialist and an economist. He has more than 30 years of work experience in public service and uh, civil society since 1986, and more than 20 years of professional work experience in the fields of uh, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, adaptation, and humanitarian action at national and international level since 1993. Outside government, Mani advised national and local government uh, agencies, as well as international and regional organizations, including the United Na Nations system, on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation for sustainable development, health emergency preparedness and management, multi-hazard early warning, gender mainstreaming, public-private partnerships, and policy leadership and advocacy. So, Secretariat, let's play the video now. Good day to all our colleagues in today's webinar of the annual public policy conference in celebration of Development Policy Research Month this September. The ongoing health crisis has exposed our vulnerabilities. It has appended the way we live and the way we do business. 
and triggered a domino effect that has destabilized the interconnected system of human health, the environment, and economic stability. Unfortunately, the pandemic is not the only threat we face today. Climate change is a much bigger threat that has already taken so much away from us, and it will continue to do so, killing our people, destroying our environment, and bringing our cities and communities into ruin if we allow it to maintain its present trajectory. This is not conjecture, but science. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently released the first of its four-part sixth assessment report. It confirms the grave risks of a warming world and tells us that the observed climatic changes are unprecedented. It confirms that temperatures are higher than they have ever been in the last 125,000 years. It tells us without any ambiguity that human influence is unequivocal. The report also shares the dire consequences of failing to heed the science. Climate risk spares no one. Every home washed away by rampaging flood waters. Every forest that goes up in smoke due to ever drier and ever hotter conditions. Every life lost due to disaster. These are all part of the inventory of sufferings due to the world's warming by 1.1 degrees Celsius. Imagine what more could happen if the world warms further due to inaction and indifference. The AR6 reaffirms what we already know so far, that the climate crisis is at hand, that its adverse effects could be irreversible. We have very little time left to act so as not to breach the climate threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Importantly, AR6 tells us that something can still be done, but it must be done now. The 1.5 Paris goal remains within reach, so long as we heed the call of science for deep and drastic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. The effects of the crisis felt in the here and now can sometimes draw us into myopia, addressing the immediate while placing the long term in the back burner. But the climate crisis did not happen overnight. The world is only now coming to a boil, but the climate crisis simmered over centuries of human activity, building on cycles of extraction and consumption and trench over generations worth of decisions. As such, its solution requires long-term thinking and planning, along with drastic and urgent action for transformation. The theme of this year's annual public policy conference, Reset and Rebuild for a Better Philippines in the Post-Pandemic World, aptly stresses that in building from the crippling effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is not enough to merely adjust to a new normal. We must create a better one. We cannot go back to business as usual. We must embrace practices that will place equal importance on economic, social, and environmental well-being, not only for the now, but for tomorrow. We do this not through speculation, but through decisions and policies informed by science. We must recognize the relevance of research and development while fusing scientific knowledge, innovation, and policy making. In doing so, we protect the gains we have achieved so far while averting disasters, safeguarding jobs, incomes, and livelihoods, enhancing food supply, promoting environmental sustainability, and combating poverty. Through science, our cities will be planned better. Our farmers and fisher folk will be more adequately supported. Our people will live in a healthier and safer environment, and our economic growth will finally start 
to benefit all. In responding to the health, climate, and environmental crises, we must ensure that our actions do not restore the vulnerabilities we had before, more so engender new risks. We must rebuild our communities to become ever more adaptive and resilient to climate change and disasters. We must also ensure that effective and transformative solutions to the country's many pressing socio-economic and sustainability challenges are tirelessly sought and pursued. In closing, I urge all key stakeholders, the national government agencies, the local government units, private business, and civil society to collaborate in pursuing a climate resilient and sustainable pandemic recovery for the country. The cohesion and coherence of our actions and ways forward would define the speed and success of our country's recovery toward genuine growth and inclusive development. The only way forward is to heed the science and make decisive actions towards staging a recovery that will pave the way for a better life for the Filipino people. One that will ensure a healthier, greener, and safer future for the generations that will come after us. Thank you. Mabuhay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you uh, to the Climate Change Commission for sending that video. And uh, as uh, we have uh, witnessed, the Secretary emphasized the urgency of climate actions. And um, he said, uh, do this not through speculation, but through decisions and policies informed by science. So uh, very consistent with what we are pushing um, for in uh, the PIDS, no, science-based policy making. So again, the Secretary's representative, Mr. Ludwig Federigan, Acting Chief of the Information and Knowledge Management Division of the Climate Change Commission, will be available to answer questions. So let us now proceed to the open forum, the much awaited open forum. Uh, the Secretariat has already sent me questions from the chat box and from uh, FB Live participants. There are a lot of questions, but uh, we will strive to stay within the 45 minutes allotted for the uh, open forum. Uh, so let us start. Uh, I think uh, for this first question, uh, Dr. Jerry Velasquez uh, may want to answer. So from Catherine Nanta, there was a mention on taxing businesses or pushing businesses to be more sustainable or green in their operations. Do we also see this happening in the agriculture sector? For example, there were studies saying that the livestock uh, sector is a big contributor to uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, how should uh, governments approach this? Other speakers who want to share their thoughts may also do so. Uh, many thanks. Um, so um, governments have many ways to deal with uh, policies that they could deploy. Uh, one way is to deploy taxation, uh, for example, putting a price on carbon. Uh, so there are carbon taxes that have been deployed by various governments uh, so far. And when I say uh, carbon, it will, uh, it will uh, encompass multiple sectors, uh, including uh, agriculture, if so uh, deemed uh, appropriate. So it is possible to, to do this. Um, Unfortunately, as of now, agriculture has not been really, I mean, one of the main things, maybe the difference between agriculture and climate change is that climate change, we know the problem and there are evidence of what we are doing to resolve the problem. It's not yet there, but we, we have the means. We know what to do. Agriculture and food, we don't even understand the scale of the problem and it is net negative. We are producing food that actually is destroying our way of life fundamentally. And um, that is a scary um, problem in itself. And uh, I think it's a different discussion. At the moment, there is an ongoing discussion at, in New York because the General Assembly is meeting and there is a summit on food and agriculture. And this is one of the key things that they're discussing there. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you for that uh, very um, uh, straightforward answer and uh, your observation about the uh, um, uh, food and agriculture uh, is uh, very um, well noted and uh, actually a regenerative agriculture as one possible area uh, for green recovery is uh, one hot topic. So thank you for, for your insights. Now let's proceed to the next uh, question. Um, Professor Ko, uh, this is for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, constraints uh, on reforestation. Uh, appropriating degraded lands for reforestation, uh, as you said, may compromise the livelihood, food security, and right lands of uh, land users, which could be smallholder farmers. What incentives can be given to private landholders, not smallholders, to use their land for reforestation? Private idlelands can be put to good use by tapping them for environmental purposes. Professor Ko. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for the question. I think I think first of all, uh, regardless of whether the the land users are smallholders or, or you know large private landholders, um, we should always stick by the principle of free, you know, prior and informed consent uh, to engage uh, these land users and landowners uh, to understand um, their, the users of the land and their um, considerations for potential alternative uh, activities on their lands. Um, when it comes to private landholders, uh, the larger landholders, I think one potential way to incentivize the transition of their land to Know, reforestation activities or if there are standing forests on their land to forest protection activities uh, is to consider um, uh, implementing forest carbon projects on those lands either forest protection projects or reforestation projects with the intention to have those projects be certified uh, based on internationally recognized standards and have the uh, uh, resultant carbon offset credits be, uh, be sold or traded in international uh, carbon markets. Uh, uh, for example, the internet, uh, global voluntary carbon markets. Um, of course, there are problems or issues to, to consider uh, if, uh, if they do go down that path in terms of uh, the need to ensure that these carbon projects and products uh, are of high quality, uh, of high integrity uh, and credibility. And therefore, that's why the standards are important. Um, and there is also the, the issue of um, potentially uh, quite significant upfront costs to uh, establish these projects on their land. So they would pro potentially uh, probably have to work with uh, other uh, private stakeholders to, uh, to, to go into uh, these kinds of joint ventures for that to happen. Uh, so I think um, the voluntary carbon markets uh, is uh, a way, a potential avenue to help uh, in incentivize the transition of these lands to uh, nature-based uh, forest projects, carbon projects. Thank you for your insights. Uh, uh, let me also uh, contextualize um, the voluntary carbon market uh, that you are uh, uh, discussing uh, that uh, uh, will be tried in the energy sector, but um, uh, uh, there's no um, concrete plans yet for for the other sectors. And thank you for your insights. Uh, let's proceed to the next question. Uh, Mr. Uh, Francia may want to answer this, or other speakers too. So from Jericho Andres of uh, GIC Philippines, um, what are your thoughts on establishing a flexible power system in the Philippines and uh, how can we move forward to achieve net zero targets with the given concern of the following, coping with the variability and uncertainty of the different renewable resources, different regional demand time scales, reliability of supply to meet all customer energy demand. Mr. Mm. Francia? Yeah, so I think the, the fundamental point here is that we have to go through an orderly and methodical 
energy transition. It's not going to happen overnight, obviously. Uh, there are going to be challenges, and, and it's a long journey. Now, I mean, the Philippines has not uh, committed yet to net zero, but has given some targets of carbon reduction. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we would need to still rely on some of the more traditional sources like coal and gas, uh, similar to, to the introductory remarks uh, mentioning uh, uh, our good friend uh, Manny uh, Rubio's point of view that, you know, whether we like it or not, there is a role for conventional like coal uh, plants uh, to, to play uh, in the medium to long term. Uh, I, I just cannot see uh, uh, a way to replace or retire all of these coal plants in the next decade uh, or so. Having said that, uh, I think we, we, we need to uh, start thinking ahead. I think it's a good thing that the DOE already announced a coal moratorium policy. Um, we don't expect much more coal plants to be built maybe just another one or two at most, uh, if at all, uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, but beyond that, it will have to be uh, at least natural gas. I think gas has a, a good role to play, one, to, to fill the baseload demand that coal will uh, be uh, leaving vacant, uh, if you will. And number two, while battery storage is still not as competitive priced, natural gas, given its flexible nature, can also complement the variability of renewables. Now, over the next three, five, seven years, as battery storage becomes uh, competitive price, then it can start really uh, complementing the variability of renewables until such a time uh, that it can start uh, replacing the, the capacity filled by natural gas. But it's gonna take uh, a, a couple of decades uh, uh, given this uh, uh, transition. Now, in the 2030s, uh, I guess uh, there's a lot of talk just in the last 12, 18 months on green hydrogen, which could be a possible source uh, of, of power, although the, the more immediate use of green hydrogen uh, would arguably be on industrial uh, use. Uh, but there's also a thesis where it can also be the fuel uh, for for uh, power uh, generation, uh, but uh, our our hypothesis is that it will take at least a decade before we get to that stage. And again, one point to consider is maybe the investors in natural gas plants would uh, consider doing a multi fuel or a flexible uh, uh, te technology to to be able to shift from natural gas to green hydrogen later on. There are such uh, technologies. Uh, available already in the market. I'm not sure about the economics at this point, uh, but but it is a theoretical possibility that uh, we need to, to to address. Thank you, thank you. Uh, very um, important ideas, especially uh, the need to start thinking ahead. And uh, uh, just for the avoidance of doubt, the coal moratorium policy of the government, uh, which will help the private sector plan ahead, uh, that applies for greenfield projects but yes, uh, not yes. for, for, for the uh, already approved ones and for the uh, expansion projects of uh, existing ones. And thank you also for pointing out uh, the possibility of uh, having multi-fuel technology for our uh, generating plants. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's uh, uh, pick um, uh, the uh, another question um, sent to me by the Secretariat. And it's actually the second question of uh, uh, Jericho Andres of GIC Philippines. And I think uh, uh, th this can be answered by the Climate Change Commission representative. Uh, to ensure accountability in our goal towards green and inclusive recovery for the Philippines, what are the plans, short, medium to long term, of the government in ensuring transparency reporting? For example, enhanced transparency, transparency framework of the Paris Agreement, verifiable monitoring and evaluation systems and related frameworks. And are there other kind of examples where we could learn from? Mr. Uh, Federiga? Yeah, good morning, uh, Dr. Navarro. On behalf of Climate Change Commission, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Navarro have said that uh, the Secretary is heavy right now in meeting for the 
with the budget hearing that is really happening uh, this week uh, in the plenary of the, of the Philippine Congress. Now, uh, to answer the question, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, the Climate Change Commission is the lead agency, especially the focal agency uh, leading for the crafting of the roadmap for um, our nationally determined contribution, which is our commitment uh, to uh, to Paris and climate. Well, the one that we submitted uh, last April uh, to UNFCCC is really in a, a more overarching statement of Philippine commitment. And uh, I think uh, what you would see there is a, a message conveying that the Philippines commits uh, to reduce its uh, its emissions uh, by as much as 75 percent uh, by the year 2030, and hopefully to achieve net zero by the year. Uh, 2050. Um, to directly answer the question, uh, I will tie it up with NDC uh, because right now we are in the roadmap of crafting and uh, you know the the implementation for NDC, uh, not only for for the entire national government, of course, including the other sectors uh, of the of society, business, civil society, and of course uh, the general public, together with the other uh, sectoral agencies. Uh, uh, that we have prioritized in the in the in the draft, no? and this includes what we call uh, the out fair, which is agriculture, waste, uh, industry, uh, transportation, um, forest, and and energy. No? And along this uh, document, of course, uh, to craft that particular portion where accountability and transparency will be incorporated, so that uh, we can accept uh, these from the government agencies. Who would be involved in the implementation of our Philippine action? I hope I sufficiently answered the question uh, asked uh, at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Rabala. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Federigan. And uh, thank you also for giving us uh, updates on the uh, nationally determined uh, contribution. And uh, uh, while the Philippines is uh, uh, you know, submitting its uh, compliance, uh, I must say that uh, we are also, the, the government is uh, also uh, very much aware of the trade-offs uh, involved. So we, we do not want to uh, overcommit ourselves, but at the same time, we want our private sector to maximize uh, their participation. So let's uh, proceed to the um, uh, next question. And uh, uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, can be uh, answered uh, by uh, Dr. Jerry Velasquez, given his uh, exposure to developing countries programs. And uh, the CCC uh, may also want to answer. Um, so the question is from Facebook. And uh, what projects can you recommend to um, cooperatives to be able to participate in climate change adaptation and uh, mitigation? So uh, you must be familiar with the uh, uh, cooperatives, a, a type of uh, uh, members um, uh, only uh, organization that uh, can engage in uh, uh, business pursuits for the benefits of its members and um, uh, nearby communities. Thank you, Dr. Velasquez. Uh, many thanks. I think there's a lot of opportunities for cooperatives to to in fact uh, participate uh, on climate adaptation and mitigation. The Philippines has so many islands and most of its uh, energy is uh, distributed. I know that most um, energy is powered through diesel and they have long-term contracts. Um, so cooperatives could find a way, for example, to work with the GCF, which has a very high risk appetite. In fact, uh, the reason that we exist is to take out risks uh, and make climate projects viable. So um, if there is uh, appetite for that, uh, we could work and try and take out uh, viability risks or uh, all kinds of risks um, to, to make these projects uh, viable. And uh, it could be done um, uh, through larger cooperatives. So that's one possibility on uh, renewable energy. Um, we've had uh, discussions with some uh, uh, locations in the Philippines, especially in Cebu. And I think there are project concepts being developed on this. On adaptation, uh, we, we, we encourage, especially cooperatives, because in the Philippines, you have uh, distributed uh, governance systems, uh, barangay, and sometimes even lower than that. And it's a very good means to, to actually deliver uh, adaptation benefits to communities. So um, we do provide a lot of support for these kind of um, 
um, initiatives. And one thing that we could easily do, for example, in the Philippines, is to complement the People's Survival Fund, which is, I think, a billion, a billion pesos a year. And it's only given to local governments. We could double that, and it could be given to any other, and it's all grants, and it could be given to um, uh, other entities, including to communities, including uh, it's even possible to do private sector, but uh, then it may have to, we have to shift the concessionality. So um, uh, it is very much possible. We have uh, done this in many other countries. Uh, we've discussed this with uh, the, our focal point in the Philippines. And I think uh, we encourage, uh, especially uh, cooperatives and communities to, to work uh, with uh, the focal point in the Philippines on the Green Climate Fund, which at this moment is the Department of Finance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Velasquez. Uh, Mr. Federigan, do you want to add something? Uh, let, Dr. Navarro, let me just share. Uh, of course, I align my thought with uh, uh, Dr. Jerry Velasquez, but I just wanted to share some examples from the People's Survival Fund uh, projects, at least in the Philippines, no, which uh, Dr. Velasquez already mentioned. Um, like, for example, the PSF the funded project in Del Carmen in uh, Chergao under the leadership of then mayor, uh, then mayor Coro, where we funded a climate field school for farmers and uh, fisher folk. No? So uh, they are really part of the entire uh, implementation of the project, the cooperatives of farmers and uh, and fishermen in that area. And we know the particular challenge of this in that particular area is the possibility of uh, storm surges. No? Uh, if there are uh, strong typhoons uh, on that part of, of that part of the country. Another example is another PSF project, but this is now in the in the island of Comotes, specifically uh, the municipality of uh, San Francisco. No? And uh, the challenge of San Francisco under then Mayor uh, Arpiliano was the, the challenge of water, no? and especially uh, the potential existence of drought no? during uh, El Nino season. So in this particular project, uh, but this involves more of the uh, smallholder farmers in that particular uh, municipality. We see it to construct a rainwater harvesting system you know, in uh, most of the barangays so that it can uh, support other smallholder farmers you know, or urban gardens you know, uh, within, the, within the municipality. That's all the problem about it. Thank you. Thank you. Very good uh, illustrations. And I'm reminded of uh, a question uh, during uh, the virtual kickoff of our Development Policy Research Month, uh, uh, the need to um, streamline the what they call bureaucratic red tape in the People's Survival Fund. And uh, uh, the answer is uh, something's being done about it. And thank you for the updates. Now let's proceed to the uh, next uh, question. And uh, uh, this is from um, from uh, Kim Castillo, and uh, perhaps this can be uh, answered by Professor Ko. How can we integrate sustainability and highlight uh, nature-based solutions in the policies uh, in the Philippines? Uh, uh, given what uh, uh, you have observed um, uh, uh, in your uh, um, researches and on nature-based solutions and what you know about the Philippines. Professor Ko? Uh, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, I, I think I would be more comfortable just speaking on the experience that I have uh, maybe in Singapore, but perhaps the lessons could be transferable uh, elsewhere as well. Um, so I, I think there's a push towards uh, a transition or a transformation of businesses to a more sustainable development uh, model uh, everywhere in our region. And part of that transformation involves um, um, transitioning to a lower, lower carbon footprint right, uh, in our businesses. Um, many of the businesses have uh, announced, for example, um, uh, net zero emissions uh, targets uh, in the coming um, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, and uh, for, for many of these businesses to achieve those targets uh, would require not just um, uh, efforts to, to decarbonize and efforts to account for their carbon emissions immediately, um, but would also involve um, ways to, to offset some of those emissions uh, given the very short runway. 
And so it has to be a combination of different approaches. Of course, uh, decarbonization is uh, first and foremost most important, but um, nature-based solutions can also provide some of the, uh, could also supply some of the uh, high quality carbon offsets to, to also help to bend the curve and uh, allowing them to achieve their uh, net zero ambitions. So I think in that way, um, uh, nature-based solutions can, uh, can align very well and can support the uh, ambitions of uh, these uh, sustainability transformations in many countries and companies in our region. Thank you. Thank you for your response. And uh, uh, that's correct. Uh, lessons from Singapore may be transferable, so we better study the lessons from Singapore and uh, uh, also look at the opportunities uh, uh, for the businesses uh, to uh, transition towards a lower carbon footprint and how policies can help that. Now let's go to uh, the next question. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Francia can answer this. So this is from Antonio Avila. He said that uh, he had installed solar power on grid with 1.5 kilowatt uh, capacity and he pl uh, planned to apply for net metering, but the process is complicated. Oh, this is something that can be answered by the government, but given your <laughs> experience dealing with government, perhaps uh, you, you, you have some insights for, for our uh, uh, participants. So he said that too many requirements and the fee is being charged by the Department of Energy. Uh, do you think the government should encourage house owners to install solar power by providing incentives or tax exemption? and simplified application for uh, net metering. Also, news reports indicate that California, USA required all building owners to install solar power. Do you recommend a similar policy for the Philippines? And if I may, uh, Mr. Francia, because there are many questions. No, I, uh, let me combine the next question sure. uh, uh, because this is also something related. So from Facebook or from Roan Bakal, can government provide incentives or support for residential, commercial, industrial structures to install their solar panels? Uh, looks like the most practical solution. So what is holding the government from adapt adopting this? Again, <laughs> the Department of Energy is, uh, or even the Energy Regulatory Commission is not our guest, but uh, uh, perhaps you have some insights, Mr. Francia. Yes, uh, I think <clears throat> all of these uh, questions uh, sound like they're preaching to the choir uh, here. You know? It's it's similar to our advocacy to to simplify the the processes, uh, especially for smaller scale installation, be it on the household level or <clears throat> commercial uh, level. You no, know? and and to you know to to make the rules very flexible and encourage. Uh, there's a lot of details. I'm not going to bore. Uh, the group with with a lot of the details, but I think it's more on the simplification uh, of the process more than the incentives. The the structural uh, incentives are already uh, there. Uh, for example, uh, there is the uh, net metering um, uh, policy uh, already in place, uh, right? So for for the uh, individual who installed the 1.5 uh, kilowatts, uh, again, congratulations. That's uh, helping. Uh, all of these sustainability initiatives uh, that is likely going through benefiting from the net metering where you can also earn by selling to the grid for uh, electricity that you don't uh, use so it is already there and and by the way given where solar panel prices are today as well as uh, the relatively high cost of electricity uh, in the philippines uh, it's now averaging at the household level an all-in cost of around nine, nine to ten pesos per kilowatt hour. Uh, it does make sense. We don't need incentives uh, at the household level. The, you know, if I look at it from an investment perspective, if I I, I have a solar panel uh, in my home, uh, and I estimate the payback period to be in the five or six years uh, range, which is an excellent uh, investment if if you like, uh, no. Um, I wish that uh, AC Energy's investments were had a similar profile of a five to six year uh, payback period or a very strong return, right? So we I don't think we need more incentives than that. What I think uh, uh, we would need are the financing because not everyone will be able to afford uh, the capital expenditure and that is still an underdeveloped um, 
uh, system that we have in the Philippines. So I know I should be preaching to the likes of Bank of the Philippine Islands and so forth, but I think that's a, a huge opportunity for, for the banks. Uh, uh, you know, there's already a huge uh, lending, not only on cars, but also motorcycles, which spurred all of these uh, motorcycles that we see on the road. Uh, I think uh, there's a huge opportunity for solar panels uh, uh, as well. So it's more of that and sim simplifying the processes, uh, procedures uh, related to solar rooftops, basically. Those are the two key drivers, I would think, to really spur these uh, so-called distributed uh, generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And uh, uh, on point, <laughs> it's not a grant of incentives, but uh, making the uh, application process uh, easier. So that's also what uh, uh, we're preaching in the ease of doing business um, uh, initiatives. And also uh, and the financing uh, portion. Yeah. Need for financing. Yes. So very uh, well taken, points well taken. Okay, so let's proceed to the uh, next uh, question. And uh, this is uh, something that can be answered by the Climate Change Commission, I think. So from uh, Facebook, from Ken Ciruelo, there is consensus that there is climate change and it is uh, already substantial in the Philippine context and considering its economy and political makeup, what adaptation and mitigation courses of action would you suggest to change paradigms and to improve the quality of life of the people? Mr. Federigan. Okay. Um, uh, talking from the lens of government, uh, of course, the overarching objective of government is really to increase, uh, I mean, adaptation. Uh, given that Philippines is the, one of the mo one of the low emitting countries no, uh, for greenhouse gas emission, I think we emit uh, less than 1% uh, compared to all other countries uh, around the world. Uh, our, our focus is really adaptation. And uh, one of the many things that government has been doing, especially uh, on the side of the Climate Change Commission, is really increasing the capacity of our uh, local government units uh, in knowing vulnerability and risk no, within, the, within their community. I think it is really very important uh, that uh, communities would be made aware of the, what are the climate risks and uh, disaster list uh, that, they, that they are facing. You see, you know, especially on uh, uh, extreme weather events, or not only but of course, uh, uh, we traveled and uh, because local government. Ensuring that uh, communities are uh, back to you, the Dr. Navarro. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for your responses. Uh, but Hello, uh, Dr. Navarro, Art, uh, you were choppy. Uh, can you hear us, Mr. Federigan? Uh, I can hear you. I can hear you. Can Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, the latter part of uh, your statements. Uh, was a bit choppy, but uh, we were able to catch, I think, your uh, main ideas no, to increase adaptation efforts and uh, for uh, local government activities uh, to be uh, more uh, vigorous in this area. I is it um, uh, correct? And that would you like to um, uh, restate uh, some of your ideas, if possible? Well, actually, the that's the, that's the main idea of the message I wanted to yeah. hear me. Unfortunately, the internet connection is, uh, you know, a little bit jumpy. Okay. So I apologize for that. Yeah. Well, understood. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, another <laughs> another uh, uh, problem, another challenge that uh, we have to uh, address here in the Philippines as uh, uh, we recover. Uh, post-pandemic, you know, digital connectivity. Okay, let's uh, go to the next question. And um, uh, this is uh, something that uh, can be answered by uh, Dr. Velasquez. This is a question from Professor Inolan Sigan of UP Los Baños. Um, the assessment of uh, 
the assessment or evaluation of physical climate risk is uh, time period dependent and therefore should be in the context of uh, anticipated climate scenario, which plausible climate scenarios should be used for risk analysis for the financial system and uh, should risk be updated uh, regularly for um, specific uh, locations. And uh, let me also um, I take this opportunity to raise another question to Dr. Velasquez from uh, uh, Masaganang Sakahan. So this incorporated. So this is a, a farmers uh, uh, cooperative, I believe, uh, because Sakahan means uh, far uh, farmland. Okay, and uh, the, this is from Director Agustin. Kindly explain the formula of net environment benefit adopted by Spain, UK, US, and Germany. Why are Asian countries like China not adopting this? If the Philippines will adopt it, will the Philippines benefit? So formula of net environment benefit. Dr. Velasquez. How many thanks? Maybe I start with the last one. It, the net environment benefit is that um, investments in the recovery, so in part of the COVID recovery that invests in uh, Coal, for example, would be considered negative. Those that uh, are, uh, you know, plan to invest in renewables will be considered positive, and then you sum it all up. So the net, the, um, the negative part, is it bigger than the positive part? And then you, you, you try and see if it is net positive. So that's the simple formula that was uh, done in that context. And um, why is it that many countries are, um, Net negative. I think, as I've explained, uh, it's really you know in the in the context of uh, speed, it's more you know the trying to get the economy back on track. So most often you you invest on things that are already there, and to rethink it sometimes is quite difficult. And that's the challenge for us to rethink that investment because we've seen it before, and uh, unfortunately we. Many of us don't learn from previous lessons. The economic crisis in 2008, as I've said, uh, partly uh, we did the same. So I think that's the main point. Uh, can we break that cycle and how much of it can we shift towards more positive aspects and see the, the benefit longer term? Now on the first question, um, climate risks are location and time specific. And that's the main point about it. So if you're investing, so if you're an institutional investor and you're investing in specific companies, most often you don't consider physical climate risk and you don't know what risks they carry. You, you calculate all kinds of risks, but you don't consider the physical climate risk because uh, your, your perspective is very short. Now, usually uh, the, the, the risk will have to be tailor-made to what you're uh, investing in. So if it is something related to an investment that is up to 2050 or 2060, so your time horizon should be up to that. And it should be on the area where um, you know, the, the investments are going to be made. Now, science. Science is very important. And uh, you, you use science for uh, main, mainly three things. Uh, because, in, uh, for example, to avoid the impacts of climate change, you actually select options. And when you select options, you, you do three things with science. One, the, la the first thing you want to avoid is maladaptation. You don't want your investment to actually create problems. You, for example, you're trying to deal with drought in a particular location and you have a company, you know, pumping groundwater. So that's a very nice project, but then what if, you know, the water balance becomes uh, unstable and then, you know, instead of a, a, a regular water balance, it becomes, you know, more, uh, more drought distressed in the future. So you could, you could face uh, cases. So then you have litigation risk. So you don't want that. It's far better to have no project rather than have a maladaptive project. But then again, you also want to ensure that your option that you've selected is uh, efficient and it is not something that's already been tested before. So that's how you use science is to make sure that the options selected are actually going to solve the problem. Now, the last IPCC report said that uh, do not, you know, do not perfect it because uh, sometimes with uncertainty, there is this kind of need to perfect uh, the understanding of science. So the last IPCC report said that um, use uh, all the scenarios that you could have, including the uncertainties and make a decision. So that's the main message that we have now taken is that uh, there are many ways to, to, to understand and to develop science. 
behind your decision. And I think that is what we need to, to also take, that um, having uncertainty is not necessarily a bad thing. We can still make decisions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, your answers and especially on uh, your point on maladaptation. <laughs> the need to have a better project than a maladapted project. We only have a, a few minutes uh, remaining and uh, let me um, uh, pick uh, additional questions no, for uh, the, the small time that uh, remains. So, Mr. Francia, I think uh, you can answer this uh, from uh, the University of San Carlos, Cornelio Biguantero. Uh, he said net metering is the first policy me me mechanism under the RE Act. And uh, if half of the uh, 43,761 LGUs from provinces to barangays participate and install at least eight kilowatt solar rooftop, can the total renewable energy generated be accommodated by the existing grid? Will the international financial institutions uh, such as the GCF and the Philippine government provide the financial facility for the LGUs to participate. So I think this has been answered by uh, Dr. Velasquez uh, earlier, uh, uh, the, the uh, willingness of the GCF to fund activities like this. So uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Francia can provide us a straightforward answer uh, to this. And uh, let me combine it with uh, another question from uh, Jose Ramon Tuts Albert of uh, the PIDS and the CCC may also want to chip in. While the public recognizes uh, climate change as a problem, there has not been a clamor to shift away from coal to renewable energies as uh, the long term is not in our mindsets. The next set of leaders to be elected next year will have to manage a poorly performing economy, a debt to GDP ratio of 53%. But this crisis can show us how opportunities, not only in the green economy, but also in the blue economy, especially uh, in Benham Rice. So what strategies should be in place to convince leaders and the public to shift gears today? So that, those are the questions. Yeah, uh, if I uh, may, uh, Dr. Navarro. <clears throat> so first of all, I think it's a great uh, idea to, to have government, whether it's national government or LGUs, to embrace renewable technologies. And it could be as simple and straightforward as installing or utilizing solar rooftops in their respective uh, buildings or structures. It, it is a low-hanging fruit, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, it, it, it takes a five, six years uh, sort of a payback on a net metering uh, basis. Uh, given the relative economics of solar rooftop and the general uh, electricity cost uh, of the grid. Uh, now, uh, as to the question whether we have enough capacity in the grid uh, to, to absorb all these variable renewables, I think that's the beauty of, of distributed uh, power. You, you know, the, the limitation of significant installations of intermittent renewables like solar or wind on a utility scale, if you have it, for example, somewhere in Ilocos Norte or in Zambales or, or Tarlac or what have you, is that you, you tend to need the national grid and it crowds out uh, other uh, forms of uh, power. It's like clogging the uh, South Luzon or North Luzon expressway. The beauty of uh, doing distributed, which is solar rooftops, Right, is you are already connected to, you don't need the national grid for that. You are embedded in the distribution utility. You are using it first. Uh, and then only your excess would be uh, thrown into the network. So it's only that little <clears throat> extra. Uh, so it will not constrain the grid. And in fact, it, it uh, diminishes the need for all of the um, power that has to be centralized. <clears throat> That's the beauty of uh, distributed. Now, again, on the second part of the question uh, in terms of uh, government leadership, national policy veering away from coal, I think uh, the, the announcement, uh, I think last year by the DOE is a landmark uh, policy in terms of a coal moratorium. Uh, you, you are correct that this applies to new uh, greenfield uh, projects. Uh, but I think, uh, on top of the policy, the writing is on the wall. Uh, more and more financial institutions are shying away from supporting 
uh, new uh, coal projects. And the insurance uh, companies are also making it uh, very expensive and you know, challenge uh, uh, the economics of, of uh, uh, coal projects. So I think uh, we, we are in a good um, uh, path uh, already. Um, it's a matter of uh, the key question to me on a longer term basis is how can we do this orderly transition? It's less about should we stop building new coal plants? I think that's already a, a moot and academic question. The next big question is how can we now have an orderly retirement of these older coal plants, right? And shift uh, towards a lower carbon uh, uh, energy source, be it gas, which, which emits uh, half of uh, coal, or be it uh, renewable and, and storage. I think that's more of the open question uh, in terms of an orderly and methodical coal plant retirement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Francia. Um, Mr. Federigan, uh, would you like to add something, especially on uh, how can we shift gears today? Uh, I think uh, I just wanted, is my audio clear? Yes, yes. Okay, I think I just wanted to articulate. Uh, we know, I think, uh, that as last year, uh, the BSP or Banco Central of the Philippines issued uh, issued a uh, sustainability uh, framework, especially for financial institutions by embedding ESG, uh, not only in the entire operations, but including in the portfolio or lending portfolio of each uh, banking institution. Um, I believe that uh, when uh, banks uh, start uh, considering, uh, which I know a lot of banks have been doing that, which will start considering uh, ESG, especially uh, uh, in financing uh, power power plant projects, then uh, there is a possibility that they may also consider uh, uh, highly consider uh, renewable energy projects now uh, over and above uh, uh, coal projects. So uh, that's all, uh, Dr. Lovar. Thank you, Mr. Federigan. Uh, we are running uh, short of time, and um, uh, I would like to ask. Uh, for parting words or additional words of wisdom or wisdom or even uh, words of hope from our uh, speakers. And uh, let us proceed in the order that they presented. But uh, let me, uh, so we will start with uh, Dr. Jerry Velasquez, but uh, let me also uh, take this uh, as uh, an opportunity and I hope you could answer this important question from the NGO sector and then please give your, your parting uh, uh, messages. So from the, uh, Dr. Mary Raselles, uh, since NGOs are a major force in introducing and sustaining climate change actions at community levels, how can they get easier access to private sector funding and uh, local government uh, unit support? Uh, so please, uh, Dr. Jerry Velasquez, and uh, your uh, parting words, please, after that. Uh, many thanks. So as, as I've explained, um, one possibility is to uh, twin the People's Survival Fund with the proposal with the GCF to actually double it. And the government could give it to any stakeholder, not just the local government. It could be to civil society, could be to private sector, of course, not entirely as grants, but uh, it's possible. Or they could also select to just double the number of local governments getting the funding because there is already an existing mechanism. This is um, a mechanism that we have called enhanced direct access, $20 million, could be bigger, and it's all grants. So it could be done uh, by uh, the government. It's very easy. Uh, so we have been trying to encourage the government to do this. And uh, you have two entities that are credited for the GCF, the Land Bank and the Development Bank of the Philippines. And I think, uh, I think the survival fund is managed by the DBP. So they could submit that. So that's one possibility to engage civil society. On parting words, I really hope uh, that the Philippines can scale up its access to the GCF. As of now, the only project approved uh, by the GCF for the Philippines is a $10 million grant for Pagasa. But there is a lot more possibility for the, for the Philippines. Uh, most of the partner uh, countries in the region have access far larger resources than the GCF. We are capital agnostic. We could deploy grants. We could uh, deploy concessional loan. Our loans are very, very concessional. 0% loan, 40 uh, years tenor. We could deploy equity. 
we could deploy guarantees. We work with the public and private sector and we have very high risk appetite. We are here to uh, make the transformation at scale. Uh, at the moment, I don't think we have been uh, uh, used to that uh, potential ability yet. The kind of projects we're getting are very small and not the, what we would like to be paradigm shifting. And I really hope that the Philippines can scale up its ambition in its access to the Green Climate Fund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Velasquez. Uh, Professor Ko, maybe also hear your parting words. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, maybe I'll use one of the uh, questions uh, uh, to, and, and to answer the question as, as my parting words. So the question is about how uh, we could uh, uh, could do a better job of outreaching, or educating the public uh, so that we can take collective action uh, for our environmental and climate goals. Um, so I, I think um, given the many negative stories that we have been inundated with uh, in the media these days, I think it's important to also be able to present the, the positives, the success stories, uh, wherever we can find them. Um, because uh, I think uh, the public also needs to know that there are very uh, concrete things that can be done and there, is, uh, there, there's, there could be positive outcomes from, from those actions. And to also perhaps give them the, the, the knowledge and the tools uh, to, to allow them to feel empowered uh, that their actions and decisions and choices uh, in their everyday uh, activities can make a difference. Uh, I think that's probably um, uh, some of the, the principles that we can think about when we uh, um, carry, out, carry out our outreach and, and uh, uh, other activities uh, concerning the public. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ko. Mr. Francia, maybe hear your parting words? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. R and to PIDS for this uh, invitation and a very, very productive uh, webinar. Uh, and the insights of my uh, fellow uh, speakers. And, you know, I think it's it's an opportune time for us uh, in this age of uh, energy transition to, to make a difference. Uh, I think the silver lining here is the challenges that we face in the power sector also presents uh, a great opportunity for renewable energy to step up to the plate uh, and, and address the, the gaps, not only in terms of energy demand, but also in a sustainable uh, manner. So we're, we're, we're very committed uh, as a company to, to scale up renewables. Uh, we are highly collaborative and hopeful that the government will enforce and execute, implement the, the right policies to enable this uh, transition. So we look forward, it's, it's an exciting um, uh, era uh, and, and we're here to, to, to help lead the green recovery. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Francia. And on behalf of Secretary de Guzman and the Climate Change Commission, may we hear from uh, Mr. Federiga. Your parting words, please. Okay. Uh, I hope my audio is uh, very clear, but uh, three uh, key messages. Uh, one, uh, the science is very clear uh, on climate change and on the existence of climate change is real and it's happening right now. Two, uh, is uh, climate change is not an environmental problem. It is actually uh, an everything problem because it affects uh, every facet of, of, uh, of human life. And three, we know that uh, this is not only within the purview of government, it requires the entire society, you know, the full collaboration of every sector of society to address this bigger issue of, uh, of climate change. That's all the coronavirus. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Federigan. I must say that um, uh, this is a very interesting webinar. Um, and uh, I must also say that recent events uh, prove that uh, this uh, uh, overall conference theme on resetting and rebuilding, uh, as well as our specific theme today on green and inclusive recovery are highly re relevant. No? So what are these res recent events? The virtual UN General Assembly is happening this week and it has been said that uh, many hope that the Assembly will offer a reset moment for a global response that has broadly failed lower income countries. At the same time, the Philippines preparation for post pandemic recovery is being made more interesting and sometimes complicated by activities related to the 2022 national election and Filipinos hope that the outcome will provide a sort of a reset moment 
for the response and recovery programs, which we hope will be green and inclusive. And we in the research community want to keep that hope alive by being duty bearers in evidence-based policy discussions. As we indeed say, kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan. So thank you once again, our honorable speakers, for being generous with your time and talent, and we hope to be able to interact with you again. Thank you also to our audience. We're inspired by your interest. And before we officially close, let me make some announcements. And uh, you will see some slides being shown by the Secretariat. Um, the presentations you heard today can be downloaded from the PIDS website. Just go to the events section. You may also download the files from the DPRM website at dprm.pids.gov.ph. So please improve uh, or help us improve our webinars by answering the survey that will pop on your screen when you leave the meeting room. Your feedback is important to us. And be updated on the latest uh, PIDS knowledge resources and forthcoming events. Just follow us on our website at uh, pids.gov.ph and our social media accounts on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining the three webinars for this year's uh, annual public policy conference. Our last webinar, which also includes the closing program, will be on Thursday, September 23. We'll tackle the last uh, APPC sub-theme on developing a robust and healthy workforce during and after the pandemic. For more information about this year's DPRM celebration, simply visit the DPRM website at dprm.pids.gov.ph. It contains everything that you need to know about our celebration this year. The site will be accessible even after September. We also encourage everyone to use the hashtags flash on the screen when sharing posts about the DPRM on your social media accounts. And finally, we would like to thank all the agencies from the government, private sector, academe, civil society, and media that joined us today. So you can see the names of these entities on the screen. We also appreciate the participation of our Facebook viewers and those who follow the live tweets of this webinar via our Twitter page. We look forward to seeing all of you again next Thursday, September 23, for the final webinar of our 2021 APPC webinar series. Thank you and a pleasant day to all.